Hello and welcome to the Bond Revisited podcast with me, Tom. And me, Joe. The podcast where we rewatch the Bond films one by one, discuss them, and then rank them alongside the other Bond films to build our own definitive list for the Bond franchise. You are listening to episode 9, where we'll be revisiting the film The Man with the Golden Gun. Now, I want to start with the big questions. The big question here. Oh, okay. Is The Man with the Golden Gun the worst name for a Bond film in the entire franchise? Wait, in the entire franchise? In the entire the franchise. Not not just the ones that we've looked at so far? No, no, no. Let's put it all on the table. Wow, okay. Well, I'm going to go with no. Why would you go over no. it? Octopussy is pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. We always have Octopussy. I always forget about that one. Yeah, that one sneaks in there, I think, still. I was just kind of thinking about it, though, because like there is such a style to the names of Bond films you know that you can tell when one is a you know when a title is like Bondy and stuff like that I, I don't envy the current producers and staff having to come up with new Bond titles but with all these classic ones you kind of just don't think about them after a while mm. but this one I was thinking about it was like it's just called the man with the golden gun surely that's that's not very good is it Oh, I mean, I think it's a bit long. Mind you, so it was on Her Majesty's Secret Service. There's a lot of syllables in that. But, you know, it's got the gold element. You know, gold finger, golden gun, golden eye. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's got gold. But it's got gold. It's got the man. And it's got <laughs> the golden gun, you see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's not the best. Let's put it that way. Yeah. It should have been called Nick Knack and the man with the golden gun. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Knack's Adventures. <laughs> we miss your <laughs> the chronicles of Nick Knack. <laughs> oh, oh, Nick Knack. Yeah, I don't know. I think, um, I think of all the reasons to for, that people criticize this film, I think the title is probably one that could be forgiven. I mean, that's fair. Uh, I just want people to. I think we should all just take this moment to step back and appreciate how silly and nonsensical some of these names are, and how sometimes we shouldn't just take it, and we should do a bit of reflection. So what would you say, we're getting on a bit of a tangent, but very quickly, what would you say is the best title we've had oh. so far? Oh, so far? So far, yeah. Oh. I, I quite like Thunderball, to be Thunderball. honest. Thunderball. It's nonsense, yeah. but it's like fun spy nonsense. Yeah, I like it in, the, in, the, in terms of it's the operation name, Operation Thunderball, yeah. What about you? Uh, I, I might say the same, actually. I might say the same. Okay, cool. That's good. So, this is quite an interesting one, this film. I mean, I guess they're all interesting ones, right? I don't think I'm going to start any of these episodes saying, well, this one's just boring. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it's going to be a rough one this week. Skip this one. Yeah, just give this one a skip. But uh, no, it's an interesting one for a few reasons. Uh, one of them is that this is Guy Hamilton's last film that he directs. Yeah. So he directed Gold. Just to remind everyone, he directed Goldfinger, big hit. And they brought him back for Diamonds Are Forever. And then he stayed on for Live and Let Die. And now he's staying on again for The Man with the Golden Gun. So this is... I feel like we say this every couple of episodes. This is the end of an era. <laughs> and yeah. next week is start of a new era because we officially changed directors. And, and Guy Hamilton finally just completely steps away from the franchise. Yeah. And I mean, there's something to be said that the next film that we're going to be looking at after this one is one that is a lot more... Um has a lot more positive uh, reception. So maybe maybe it was not a bad thing that this was his last one. He's done his damage and he got out of dodge. Listen, I mean, this is coming, from, this is like from your perspective, not mine. But for you, like, you know, he did, he did Goldfinger. Well, way to go, guy. You've, you've, you've come back. It hasn't quite been the same. So off you trot. It was just, a, I mean, this is we're nothing about tangents in there, but I just, it does make me think in terms of these times where they give a certain director the keys to the franchise and just let them kind of go for a few films. I feel like it doesn't work out most of the time. No. Well, this one, I think The Man with the Golden Gun didn't do very well uh, financially, but that also could have been because it came out a year after Live and Let Die. So maybe people were just kind of a bit done with Bond. Yeah, potentially, but that's the that's the second thing that I think is quite interesting about this film that you don't always kind of think about, because of course all these films get reviews by critics and stuff, and generally we don't care what they say. We're just here to, you know, we weren't there at the time when these films came out, so we're just going back and watching them and taking them for what they are. 
but out of the entire franchise, this film was the second worst review film, like, ever, out of all of them. Really? So yes. What, so, so what, the... is Die Another Day the top? No, 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 uh, A Few to a Kill is top. Die Another Day is, like, the sixth worst. What, as in, like, contemporary reviews of it? I Yeah, I think reviews, yeah, yeah, reviews oh. at the time. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. So this oh. is the second worst, according to the people uh, at the time, which I I don't think that's maybe deserved, although we'll get into it. But yeah, yeah, like this was just panned when it came out. That's really surprising because as we'll discuss and as my kind of opinion, it's not it's not that different to live and let die in a way. So and that one didn't have such bad reception. So I, I wonder I wonder what happened. I don't know, but I, I just find it quite interesting uh, because, again, you don't normally think about this stuff, but really this was seen as a major down point in the Bond franchise. Like, this was seen as quite a low point, and to be honest, quite a few of the Roger Moore films, it's if you go purely based on the critical reviews at the time, it jumps all over the place. Like, sometimes mm. it does well, or sometimes they do badly. Like, the best and worst of Bond according to critics anyway, is in this Roger Moore era that we're currently in. Yeah, I guess that's kind of, I was going to say that must be, it must have been quite a weird feeling to be a Bond fan during that time where, it, you know, things are changing like that. But then well, you could also argue that it's been a, a little bit like that with Daniel Craig, like Quantum of Solace was kind of poorly received and then Skyfall was great and then Spectre was kind of on the down again. So maybe not to the same extremes, but it, it maybe it's not that different. No. No, I think that's fair enough. I think Piers Brosnan was considered just started great and just went down. Daniel Craig zigzagged and, uh, yeah, I guess Roger Moore zigzagged and then Sean Connery was started great and went down. So mm. it's interesting. Yeah. But shall we get into it? Let's enough get rambling. Into it. Yeah, let's do it. So we get the circles and I think the music's different. Okay. <laughs> but I'm not sure... I always get this every single time where I, I kind of see this or listen to this kind of intro bit and maybe I'm just too focused on trying to find a difference. I think like, I think so. <laughs> like trying to find something that's different and trying to pick up on stuff. And every single time I kind of question myself, like, did they change this song? Is this song different? Am I just kind of crazy? It's just kind of hard to tell. So it's probably exactly the same. But when I first heard that music, I was like, I think this might be different. I thought it was exactly the same. Okay, cool. It probably was exactly the same. Yeah, there was no nothing standing out to me. No shimmery effect like Diamonds Are Forever. I think it was just the same. you got to let the shimmer thing go, Joe, I'm afraid. Oh. It's, it's, we've been two films. We can't keep mentioning Diamonds Are Forever and the shimmer. It will come back. It will come back with maybe Die Another Day had a bit of a funky gun barrel. I just yes. got to I just got to bide my time. CGI gun barrel. Yeah, it will come back. It's what we want. But then we get the walk, and I think it's the exact same footage from Live and Let Die of Roger mm -hmm. walking across. Yeah. Which is a shame. Not unexpected, to be honest, because I wouldn't think they would reshoot it for every film. But So we get the same solid walk and same awkward, jagged Moor shooting <laughs> the gun. Did you spot this time the, the, early, the early smoke? Yeah. Yeah, it's there. <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> oh, Roger. <laughs> he tried. Yeah, he tried. And this all leads to us going to a beach. Very nice looking beach. And there's a woman sunbathing. And straight away, we have, as the film describes, a midget. Again, mm -hmm. I think we had this before. And I can't believe we're having this conversation again about what is the politically uh, well, correct term there. It's funny you bring that up because I did, I did look this up. Well, it was whilst I was researching and just looking up some of the actors in this film. So the character in question you're talking about was played by an actor called Hervé Villachez. And it just so happens that on his Wikipedia page, apparently when he was alive, he preferred to be called a midget rather than a dwarf. Okay. So there's your answer. Cool. Nice. Let's lock that in. Yeah. Straight from the horse's mouth. Yes. That, yeah. So, yeah. So we have a, a, a midget who we later find out is Nick Knack. And is in this nice suit and basically is carrying this massive tray of drinks, which... 
They clearly make jokes at his expense throughout the film, and I'm undecided if this was meant to be a joke because he's just struggling so much. Like, they give him a comically large tray and amount of drinks on it for him to carry. It's just no need. He would have done it in two trips, I feel. Oh, I didn't I didn't spot that, but yeah. And also, I mean, can you imagine the heat in that in that little suit? Like kind of been a very, very pleasant for that four in there. No, I could, yeah, the shoot must have been a nightmare on him, I oh, guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so he's carrying this all this stuff to the woman, and as the drinks arrive, we see a man come out of the water, and it's Christopher Lee! Oh my. Yeah, and not Straight just, away. yeah, not just Christopher Lee, though, Christopher Lee with a third nipple. <laughs> <laughs> so, can I just say that this film, something about this film, something about the editing, I don't know what it is, but they really liked, uh, really drop like just in your face shots, multiple times during this. I was kind of like, oh wow, we're just cutting to something, and it's like right there. This wasn't necessarily a cut, but like it's right there in frame, the third nipple. It's all the zoom ins, and I can't remember what film did this before, but we've definitely seen this in Bond films before. I feel like not so much the Guy Hamilton films, but another one of them, where you'll just get these sudden, like, sudden quick zoom ins to focus on something. And we get that here, where it's just Christopher Lee coming out the water and they zoom in on his chest into a, a fake third nipple. And you're just like, ugh, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine going to the cinema in like two minutes? You're eating your popcorn and just like <laughs> nipple zoom. <laughs> it's a bold choice, that's for sure. Yeah, you wouldn't go for the hot dog, would you? You would. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's not an image I wanted to. Come on, stop. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea of it being called a bold choice, though. It's like such bold filmmaking. Wow. Just look at the artist. It's got midgets and furred <laughs> nipples right off the bat. If you're sitting down thinking, is this the right film? Am I, is this a is this the Bond film? Yeah. So I guess we'll talk about this guy a little bit later, I suppose. But this is Christopher Lee is our villain for today. Yeah. And we don't really get a proper intro to him because he's kind of featured throughout the film. But like, there's no big thing about it. He just steps out the ocean and is there. Um, the big thing is is the nipple. Yeah, I guess it's kind of a bit like Goldfinger, where he just walks down and starts playing that that game. It's just there. Hmm. So, yeah, Nick Knack opens the champagne for this woman and uh, Scaramanga, I'll just say the name, Christopher Lee's character is Scaramanga, the villain for the film, and they're just kind of relaxing on the beach. Uh, then a man in a black suit and, like, a black trilby, like, an, another one of these, like, American gangster s sort of guys. I didn't realise how many of the old Bond films had these type of characters in. Well, that, you say that because it is exactly the same actor. <laughs> it's the same actor from Diamonds Are Forever. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, because I, I was like, that kind of looks like him. And then at one angle, I was like, no, 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 that's not him. And then after I read, I was like, oh, wait, no, it was the same. It's the guy from the, the uh, crematorium or who drove Bond to the crematorium. Yeah, same guy. Okay, that's pretty cool. But it's uh, I know it's a Guy Hamilton thing. Like He was clearly obsessed with America or just wanted his films in America because we saw that with Goldfinger, Diamonds Are Forever, and Live and Let Die. Uh, but even when he does a film that's not set in America at all, he still squeezes in an American stereotype in there. He couldn't help himself. Oh, yeah. I, I kind of like the idea that it is actually the same person <laughs> as from Diamonds Are Forever. I mean, it's never really explained in the film, but I kind of like the idea that, yeah, this guy has come from Las Vegas to try and do what he ends up doing. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that'd be cool. So, yeah, Nick Nack basically shows this this man in black, as I'll probably call him, inside. Uh, so they're on this island, but there is this kind of big complex or lair, let's say. Uh, so Nick Nack kind of shows him in. It's another... It's another... Bond villain lair with a load of rocks inside. Yeah, yeah. I thought of you when I saw that. I, it's just like I'm so surprised that these all look the same. Yeah, it does. Yeah, this one. Well, where where he eventually leads into is interesting, but but when we see more of the lair later on, it is kind of a bit of yeah. It's just it's just the same again. You're right. It's just metal stuff and then a little bit of rocks and and steam <laughs> or vents. Yeah. I don't know if they're reusing the sets or props or anything like that, but like. Most of these bases, like you could take shots from these films 
and you probably wouldn't say which one was which because so many of them blend together like Kananga's was also like this and Doctor No was the original that's like most yeah. films have this type of base and this type of room where it's very fancy but there's just ton of, a ton of rocks in it yeah I think you're right it's, it's got it's it's kind of it's been done now that's one of the things from this film is I just don't didn't care about like the outside shots we've seen it already like the beach and then there's really cool scenery and where this was actually filmed, I think it was somewhere in Thailand. Amazing, right? Amazing sights. But once it goes indoors into these sort of bond layers like that, it's just uh, whatever. Yeah, it's just, yeah. Like you say, we've just seen it so many times. And it does somewhat just kind of not ruin the older ones, but you're just like, why didn't they just put a bit more effort into these to make them a bit more distinct? Telling you, same contractor. It must be. He's getting work. He's getting paid. He's getting even more work. A million dollars, probably. <laughs> uh so yeah so this man in black uh, in this black suit uh knickknack pays him some money says here's half and you get half afterwards uh, and then the guy gets a gun out so knickknack then kind of buggers off and goes back to scaramanga who is in a very tight one piece <laughs> <laughs> what would you call that thing i was like i want to call it pajamas but that's not fair it's like a like a is it like a tracksuit? I don't know. I guess tracksuit, yeah, but it's like one. Yeah, like a one piece thing. one. Yeah. Which is very tight. I'm like, okay, all right. We'd... <laughs> I didn't I didn't dwell on the tightness, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> okay, well they started it with the nipple stuff. Like all right, they okay. they put that in my head. I'm gonna take a look at Christopher <laughs> Lee if they're gonna put him in that. I mean he's a big man, all right. Oh well that's also very true. He's very tall. <laughs> so yeah, so this man goes into this kind of room. Again, I think it's still a fancy room with his gun. And I think I think Scaramanga's there, but then the lighting all goes red and Nick Knack is watching and moving stuff behind the scenes. And Scaramanga then just kind of rolls away from the guy. So it just basically seems like this guy is here to shoot and kill Scaramanga. And he rolls off. He then throws something at him, jumps away... And eventually gets to this closet of guns. Like Scaramanga in his own base gets to this closet of guns, but it's locked mm. and can't get any of the guns. Off which Nick Nack's like, no, 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 monsieur. You're not getting them that easily. So it's like Nick Nack is testing Scaramanga fighting up against this guy. Um, so I think then Scaramanga just kind of buggers off and goes to hide. And... The man in black, you know, the, the gangster guy, kind of enters this room. He sees this, like, glass which has Scaramanga's face on it, and he shoots it. And then this, like, manic laughing is in the background, which I think is supposed to be Nick Knack. And Probably, yeah. Yeah, I think so. And this is, like, the beginning of... Is it called the Fun House? Like, Scaramanga's Fun House? Yeah, I think, yeah, Fun House. I just know there was a video game that had a level based on this, and I think that was called Funhouse. Yeah, I think it was one of the, like, um, it was like the GoldenEye version of, uh, like, is it like the Source Engine or something like that? And they, they're one of the levels, I, I remember, like, one of them was the, the Scaramanga one, so that was kind of cool. And I think maybe, yeah, one of the PS2 ones, I remember having this as a multiplayer level. Uh, yeah, I think Nightfire might have done, but... Ah, uh... uh, yeah. But yeah, so the man enters this fun house. Basically, there's these crooked doors and things like that. And Nick Knack is kind of watching everything all on the cameras. And there's a spooky skeleton that pops out and ah. gives him a good old spook. <laughs> uh, and so this guy is very slowly going through this with his gun, just being very cautious, trying to find Scaramanga. And then a cowboy rolls out behind these saloon doors. And it's a fake dude, but he's firing his gun. And then we see a load of fake American gangsters come out and shoots everyone, of, or starts shooting, of which the guy then reacts and shoots off one of his arms. And he said something, but I couldn't understand what he was saying. I think he, like, apologises to them. Yeah, it's quite weird. He just starts talking to this Al Capone statue. I, I don't quite get it. Yeah, I, he, I think my notes say, don't hold it against me or something. I don't know. It seems... It's just like, something on. I didn't get. Well, have you got time to stop and talk to <laughs> a mannequin when there's someone trying to kill you? Yeah, I don't know. It's Americans, eh? 
Yeah. Uh, so then we see Scaramanga peeking. <laughs> I do. I also want a compilation of Bond films and people peeking behind a curtain or going round the side and having a quick look. That is something that we also see all the time in these ones. Yeah, as we're doing these, as the, like these rankings, it is becoming these little things that just you keep seeing over and over again. Yeah, and I think that kind of as we go, we'll realise that. And it might not be all the films that are like this, but this one more than ever is the one where you notice all the Bond kind of cliches and stuff like that. Not necessarily always a bad thing, but this one is the one where it really kind of was like, oh yeah, all this stuff we've seen before. Okay, cool. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but then, yeah, Scaramango is watching and Nick Knack over the mic says, oh, the golden gun. You gotta go get the golden gun. And we see that the golden gun is in a, I think, a raven's mouth. It might be a, a crow, potentially, but some sort of black bird stuffed. Mm. Um, so Scaramanga sees it, goes to grab it, but it's like a mirror or a fake. Nick Knack starts laughing at him again. But Scaramanga eventually finds the real one. And the man in black is nearby. And Scaramanga needs to go and get the gun. So there's stairs nearby. So he hits a button to turn them into slide, into a slide, super fun happy slide, jumps on them, slides down, grabs the gun, and then shoots the guy in the head. Which but, I don't yeah. know of what benefit the slide was. <laughs> like The slide I wish he didn't slide, because he looks stupid. <laughs> he's too tall to be sliding on a slide. Yeah. And it's such a tiny little slide as well. It's just it was yeah i think up until this point i i was i, I mean it didn't ruin it but I, I was quite liking where this was going um you know all the weird stuff that's going on and and he, this is something that we've not really seen before in a bond film all this this sort of scenery and weirdness like general weirdness like this with the ocapone and the skeleton and i like some of the mirror work that they had in these shots um rotating mirrors kind of clever camera work and things like that and and then it ends with him like yeah really awkwardly sliding down this tiny little set of stairs that are now slide and it's like oh okay that's how he's going to take out the goon fine it's a great stunt though one of the better stunts in the guy one the, era one of the very few stunts in this film to be honest <laughs> it's it's up there in terms of yeah. the better ones uh, so yeah so he shoots the guy and then we see a fake model of Roger Moore as James Bond. Uh, Nick Nack takes the money off the guy that he paid him previously, and then Scaramanga shoots off the fingers of the James Bond doll, and then that kind of wraps this up. And yeah, overall, as you were kind of saying, the atmosphere of this kind of sequence, and it is quite slow paced, but it kind of does it in a way to its advantage. Like you are just go, you're following this guy going through this fun house, and because it's the very start of the film, you don't really know what to expect. So even though it's all kind of a bit silly, there is actually a really good tension with this scene. And this whole scene also does something I really like, which the last film did, which is they're showing you something now so they can reference something later in the film. And I always really like that payoff. Like, I actually really enjoy that kind of formula for these sort of opening sequences. So overall, I did actually quite enjoy it. Uh, I quite enjoyed the last one, I think. Uh, but this one was actually quite a good time. It's a nice way to set up Scaramanga and just have something a little bit different, which isn't a big explosive action scene, but kind of works on its own. Yeah, it's still it's still a, a tense scene, as you say. I, I really liked it too. I can even forgive the awkward slide. Um, and you're right, like the payoff that you get for this is is definitely is definitely worth it. Because and also just like if you're watching this in the cinema and and this was the first time you were seeing it and you just see bond there like a statue of bond it's like what the hell what the hell's going on like that actually makes you kind of huh moment so it's it's a it does what it needs to for the beginning of the film oh definitely yeah it's just a great mix of being a standalone interesting scene while also establishing stuff to being up later in the film and scaramanga like having it focused just on him and nothing to do with bond is kind of really smart as well i think as you said about Goldfinger being introduced straight away, they kind of do this here, but you get a scene with just Scaramanga and Nick Knack doing stuff. And I think that's actually really interesting just to see the villains doing something. And then at the very end, they tie it to Bond. Like, I like that, uh, the way that plays out. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me of From Russia of Love, kind of. Um, well, 
I mean, Bond was in that the whole way, but like just that payoff at the end, that sort of surprise shock moment. That's that's what I really liked. Um, mm. Unfortunately, I say unfortunately because I think when it leads into the title sequence, I thought this title sequence was really bad, <laughs> like, <laughs> really bad. So so basically, yeah, it goes into um, you know, Roger Moore and all that sort of stuff. But in terms of like theming, I know we said in Never Let Die, I think it, we were both in agreement that although although it was um, so it had some interesting shots with the skulls and fire, having that sort of black background and, and the, those elements is getting a little bit repetitive. And this one is just more, even more of that, but without the interesting skulls and flames. This is basically just um, r- reflections and ripples of water with with the names and credits reflected in them. And it really is just that for the whole thing. I can't really think of anything too interesting from this title sequence. And... What really gets me is that having just watched what you've watched, they were so well set up to have some really cool, interesting visuals with mirrors and lights and all sorts of weird things like from the funhouse. I think that would have been a really cool thing to go down um, visually. But no, it, it's instead it's just reflected water, which I couldn't really quite understand the connection to the film. To you're so right. I never thought about that, but you're right. Like a funhouse styled opening it would have matched the song quite well as yeah. well due to the energy it brings that would have been amazing if they did yeah. that. yeah sadly sadly not but i yeah i don't understand i feel like this is a monkey paw moment where last week and i said about how i'm kind of sick of the black backgrounds and living and die did have the strong theming but i want something a bit different and this one changes the backgrounds by having this kind of water ripple effect and then just strips away all the strong feeling. It's like, oh, I can't have both, can I? I can't have <laughs> strong visual identity and just not the standard black backgrounds. Because I would yeah. say, yeah, they have mixed up the backgrounds. But yeah, it's just water. It's water and then women being reflected in the water and then a golden gun being shown. Yeah. And just none of it kind of matches or blends together at all. There's just no theming here that's interesting. No, no, not, not, uh, not a fan. I mean, the best moment, and really it doesn't match anything else, is where they zoom in on this woman. Then at the very end, they impose a skull over her face. Oh, I must have missed that bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's very subtle. It's like quite a long zoom. It's like her, like kind of on her side looking at you. And then it kind of zooms in. And it's quite subtle, to be fair. But they, I'm pretty sure they do. Maybe I'm just crazy. But they like impose this slight skull. It's not very... Oh, you know, it's not like the live and let die skulls where it's on fire in your face. They just kind of add it on slightly. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I still don't think that's enough, but I didn't. I must have completely missed that. Oh, well. There's a red firework as well, though, Joe. Don't forget the red firework. Oh, yeah. I sadly missed the, the fiber optic, uh, you know, uh, brushy thing. Where was that? Why <laughs> couldn't that make a comeback? They didn't have the budget for it. <laughs> they could only hire that for one film. Yeah, it's like we've got a firework instead. That's that's what we can afford. <laughs> oh. But what about the song, Joe? Okay, so the song I a lot of people a lot of people don't like this song. Well that's the that's the impression I get, uh, in terms of like the Bond fandom and community. I don't think it's that bad. I think a lot of people cr- criticize maybe the lyrics of it, and they say like the lyrics are kind of stupid because it's like very overt even for a bond song you know like uh what was the line what is the line um who will he bang right you, like <laughs> so it's like yeah okay that's kind of a bit but i mean really no, no no bond song has had amazing lyrics like to me it's just how they sound and how like they make you feel for the beginning of the film um and i think this one actually sounds pretty good i, I kind of like the tone of it and although we do hear this a lot Kind of like similar to Live and Let Die, where it's, it's used a lot in the instrumentals and things and the soundtrack. I think it's a good starting point. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a big fan of it. No? Maybe I'm representing most people. I'm really not too sure. This is a theme I never really hear about, you know? It's like people might bring up the Madonna one, Die Another Day, and just say, Ah, oh, what a terrible, what's going on here? I can't believe it, blah, blah, blah. And then other ones for being good. This one I feel like just so sits in the middle that it kind of gets forgotten. Uh, a little bit like the rest of the film, you can argue. 
Uh, but this one just kind of just does nothing for me. Like it's quite a different style compared to any other type of film because it is more bouncy and upbeat in a lot of ways. And Lulu's clearly having a lot of fun and I'm happy for her. Uh, I just don't, it just doesn't do anything for me. Like I don't really hate it, but it's not a song I'd ever listen to. And so I guess an interesting fact about this film, just kind of talking about the music. So John Barry is back for this one. And part of John Barry's job is writing the themes. So, of course, Paul McCartney handled it last time. And I think George Martin probably helped. But, you know, obviously it's probably just Paul McCartney doing it. But John Barry writes the themes with the artists, uh, which happened for this one. But he only had three weeks to do the music for this film. Oh, my God. Three weeks? Yeah. So he kind of rushed it. And there's a lot of stuff that you can read about it where he says, this was my worst film musically. I only had three weeks. There's a lot of stuff I regret. A certain stunt and sound effects that plays. He says, terrible. I don't know why I did it. Definitely wouldn't do it (laughs) if I had to do it again. And I think the theme, this theme kind of does reflect that kind of a bit rushed sort of feel. Um, Because it doesn't really have that strong of a hook. Like it does have a hook, but not that strong of a hook. And it doesn't really... I mean, the main riff at the start's pretty good. That's not too bad, but... Yeah, again, it just doesn't really have that killer kind of edge. And I think the fact it was rushed is probably part of that. Yeah, I mean, uh, that does kind of add up because I I think, although I do like the main theme, theme really, I I think the rest of the film soundtrack is a bit lacking and the music is not really one of the standout points for me for this film. So (laughs) saying that he had three weeks to do it, yeah, that that adds up. Hmm. There was definitely some stuff I like about this soundtrack, though. Um, I wasn't too negative on it, but I think you really hear it in the themes when they're rushed like a certain another way another way to die (laughs) oh don't remind me of that song jeez yeah (laughs) um when it's rushed you kind of feel it so this one for being rushed it's not too bad but just so to me just so whatever in terms of the theme and eventually this well it ends no more ripples i'm afraid we've got a film to get to and this time we cut to bond entering m's office yeah, no more no bonds. time wasted. Yeah, no robes. No JB on the robes. <laughs> sadly. Oh, I forgot about the robes. Yeah. No. Yeah, there's still robes in this film, don't worry, but not not as many as the last one, I don't think. Hmm. Different sorts of robes, yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, so Bond enters M's office, so we get a more traditional scene. What was the last time we got? Bond going into the office and getting briefed in this way? That's a good question, to be honest. I mean, yeah, I guess the last couple of times they've been... Oh, no, I guess been... Diamonds Are Forever did do it, didn't he? Because there was the Diamond guy who came and explained the situation. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose that does count, yeah. Yeah, we do see this office, but it does feel like because they've kept... Like, it's really nice to see it again because they keep doing differences, like in the last film and when they were in the submarine and things like that. But it's like, oh, it's they should have done this last time. But it is really nice to see Roger Moore as Bond just entering M's office and do the more standard briefing like this. Yeah, I think the fact that we didn't have it last time, uh, and the same with Q as well, when we see Q later on, it, it makes this all the better because it's like, okay, now we're back we're back to normal. Living at Die, they were getting, they were, you know, trying new things, getting Roger in. And now, like, yeah, they know that that's what people want to see. Yeah, 100%. So... Bond enters and there's a couple of guys with him uh, who are kind of in the background and M asks him, what do you know about Scaramanga? And we get some great acting here from Roger. I always like these moments <laughs> where he's like, hmm, let me think. Ah, yes. <laughs> then goes, like, recites a massive amount of information explaining his entire backstory and life and what Scaramanga is all about off the top of his head. It's a bit much. <laughs> it is a bit much. It's a bit I much, get the, but I like I get, it. I get the joke they're trying to do. Yeah, it is a bit much. And um, I, I did, I got to say, like straight off the bat with Roger Moore, compared to Live and Let Die, I just feel like, even though it was just a year later, for me, there's just something about his performance in this film that just clicks with me a lot better than Live and Let Die did. And I think he just, you can, you can really feel the comfort of him being in this role, or at least for me, compared to the first film. Uh, and like, yeah, that's really evident even straight away with this this M briefing scene. 
he just loves doing those things. That Sean Connery did this as well, being the expert on everything. But they do it multiple times in this film, and you can just see in the same way that like Sean Connery loved doing the fake. Oh, I'm this person now and getting into it. Roger Moore just loves acting it up and hamming up the whole like, mm, I'm the expert and here's all the information I know. He is good at hamming. I'll give him that. He's a hammer. Mm -hmm. So I didn't write down all the information because he says so much in such a short amount of time. There's just no way you can retain it all. I think roughly he was raised in a circus and then eventually was a K... What's it called? The Russian agent? What's it called again? I, I'm surprised KBJ. you're even trying to do this, to be honest with you. Like, I didn't take it. I didn't take aboard any of this. Uh, KGB? KGB. That's the one. K, KGB. Uh, he was an ex-KBG uh, agent, and now he's an assassin who charges $1 million for every hit that he does. And then he's like, ah, he's also got a third nipple, which <laughs> <laughs> everyone know. knows about it. Way ahead of you there, Bond. Yeah, we've already seen... <laughs> We've, we've been introduced. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So M then, after not being impressed, of course, uh, hands Bond this golden bullet, which was sent to MI6 addressed to James Bond, and it has 007 written on it. Uh, which then we get a great little line where Bond is all like, who would pay one million to have me killed? And M's just like, disgruntled hub husbands... <laughs> Annoying tailors. <laughs> <laughs> I can think of many people. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I love that little bit. Oh, M just has not lost his touch. I think there's there's not been one where M stuff of just being annoyed with Bond. And this might be the most in this film he gets annoyed with Bond and just kind of pretty much insults him. Yeah, I don't know. I I think there's like as we see in this in later on in the scene, there's a little twinkle in his eyes still. Like he gets annoyed with Bond, but you know, he he likes him really deep down. Sure. It just seems like he goes more more all in on some of these. Hmm. And M says, well, Scaramanga has sent the bullet for you, so you're a target. So you can no longer do your current assignment. Of which they quite specifically explain what the assignment is, which is, well, there's an energy crisis. And what am I going to do about Gibson and the solar cell data stuff? Uh, which is quite important. Initially, you might think, yeah, whatever, he's talking about solar energy. But it does come back. Uh, his old assignment is relevant to all of this, which is why they specifically drop it in this scene. Yeah, it's definitely something easy to miss. Um, I, I remember like, as we get on later in the film, I had to think, like, oh, that's what that was referencing. So, yeah, it's it's a little detail, but as you say, it makes a big big part of the plot. Definitely. So this leads on Bond. Basically, M saying you got to take time off. He was like, you can either resign or I'll let you take some sabbatical. And Bond is kind of a bit confused by this, but he kind of starts figuring out what's going on. And he's like, well, if I found Scaramanga first, would that change things? And M is like, it might change the situation. Of which you get a big old grin of Bond. Because basically M is saying you can go on sabbatical and no longer worth this case to basically be free to go investigate what's going on with Scaramanga. So he doesn't directly say it, but you can tell with the way Bond reacts to it and the way M is that, yeah, M does have Bond's back here. He's letting him do... Officially, he's just saying, you're a liability, bugger off. But really, he's allowing him to go and pursue uh, Scaramanga. Yeah, he's being a little bit coy. Like, well, I'll never tell. <laughs> Oh, what, whatever you do, Bond, is up to you sort of thing, which I, I like. It sort of has that element of... Um, sh shows the bond between the characters, right? Because there's an element of trust there. Mm, yeah, it's really nice. I'm going to be really sad when Bernard Lee stops appearing in these films. I can't remember which one it is, but that's going to be a sad oh. sad podcast when we'd have to do that. Yeah, it's Moonraker is his last one. How is I, it? I can even think of the scene, which is his last one, which is actually not too dissimilar in what, what we're discussing. So is it is in going space? to be sad. <laughs> he gets he gets shot by a laser. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's in Venice, but anyway, we'll get we'll get there. Okay, we'll get there. Uh, yeah, so this leads to Bond then leaving the office and going to see Money Penny. It is the one hundred percent traditional Money Penny scene, and maybe it was just me, 
But is Money Penny starting to look a bit old? Well, I I wrote down. This is my notes, like straight off the page. Money Penny glasses. Ooh. Right? Oh no. Those glasses are not, are not doing her any favors because the second she takes them off, she looks she looks great. But those, she's got old lady glasses on at the beginning of this scene, and it's like, no, take them off, take them off. <laughs> I was thinking it probably is the glasses. I was like, is it the hair? Her hair's a bit different, but maybe that's a bit harsh. But they're giving her a bit more of a old secretary vibes than they used to for this. Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think um, I I didn't quite get that yet. Later on, as they all age and they're kind of like, they all start to look a bit old. Yeah, I think for now I'm all right. And especially because, I mean, I, it's difficult to compare sort of like the relationship between the Bond actors and, and Money Penny. Like Sean, Sean was always quite good with the Money Penny scenes. Uh, but I do think Roger's probably, this is just my memory, so we'll see when we actually watch the later films. But I think Roger's probably a little bit better. I do, I do like the scenes between Roger and, and Money Penny. Oh, would you say that's true for this scene between them as well? Yeah, I, I like this one. Yeah. I like the ending bit. Yeah. Because a lot of this is bit. just actually them talking about the mission. I'm like, what's going on here? <laughs> They're actually talking about Scaramanga and Bond's trying to get information out of Money Penny. What? That's not yeah. right. I know, right? She's actually doing her job. Hey, now. <laughs> I mean, I'm not blaming her for it. That's Bond <laughs> who just comes out and just starts being all a big old flirt. But like we actually get like thirty seconds of them talking, like actual operatives exchanging info. Yeah, no marriage talk or anything like that, quite yet. So yeah, so basically, it's Bond asking about somebody who was killed. Uh, I think William Fairbanks. I think is the name. Yeah, double o two. Double was it double o two? Yeah, I think it's a double o two. Oh, I missed that entirely. Yeah. Oh, that's kind of nuts. Hmm. Oh, put top of the list. Top of the list. Uh, so, yeah, so 002, uh, William Fairbanks and Money Penny just basically says where he died and, and how he died. And Roger then calls her darling. I can't remember exactly what he says, but he talks about, like, how come they weren't able to trace it or something like that and calls her darling, of which she instantly comes back and is like, they couldn't find the bullet darling <laughs> <laughs> i love that moment specifically because of what we mentioned in the last podcast where roger moore just i don't think it appears any like as much now because they kind of call it out on screen but last film there was so many darlings and i just love that like they they realize that and they make money penny kind of yeah kind of butt heads a little bit with that oh she's just the perfect character to do isn't he there's no one better to just kind of mock bond for the things he say than money penny doing it yeah, especially with what yeah, especially with the word "darling" as well, which is quite sometimes is quite um, yeah, not the not the nicest. I guess so. I mean, he still says "darling" in the film, and I do like Roger Moore saying "darling," but yeah, they were aware of it. They made a joke about it. He still says it, but it's like way, way more toned down, and I'm assuming toned down for the rest of his run as well. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't seem quite as patronizing as it did before, maybe. Um, but he that's just a, a word that he likes. Hmm. So basically, Money Penny says that Fairbanks was last seen in Beirut in a cabaret. So we cut to a cabaret, <laughs> like straight. This is what I mean with those like harsh shots and harsh cuts, because you just cut straight to um, basically seeing the bullet in question. What Bond was just asking about. There's no trace of the bullet. You see it right there on screen. Uh, it's in the belly button of a belly dancer um, who Bond is sitting and watching in this in this cabaret in this club. And you just get a little bit of this woman dancing and it's like, okay, that's a nice dance, I suppose. Um, Bond enjoying his cigar. He's still on the cigars. He hasn't gone back to cigarettes quite yet. And all whilst this is happening, you get sort of these angry looking men. These shots of these angry looking, well, particularly one big, bald, angry looking man who's watching Bond. And I don't, I don't think it's really ever explained who these people are. I guess they just don't like Bond being there. Um, yeah, I think they, Bond they, just stands out and is basically getting a a private belly dance from this woman. Yeah, and just like, oh, damn you, sexy yeah. Roger. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's quite, sort of set up them as the as some bad guys straight away. But after after she's finished, she goes into her dressing room and and Bond just straight up follows her. There's like no 
no um no waiting around no sneaking in just walks in and hello hello darling probably um and starts to talk to her about bill fairbanks and and what she knew of where he was when he was killed and they do start to get into this a little bit about um like the bullet and why they can never find the bullet and how she keeps it as a lucky charm now as a belly button um I don't even know what it is, really. It's just like a little, not a piercing or anything, because he sucks it out eventually. It just, just sits there. Um, and it doesn't really last long, though, because this whole this whole scene, as who would have thought, it very quickly turns into a bit of flirtiness and um, a bit of bit of romancing, although it is, it is with a purpose, at least, because you can tell like Bond is he's spotted the, the bullet and he, he wants it, so he keeps getting it and she keeps slapping him away as they're, as they're kissing, and so starts to kiss her belly and like trying to get it that way. And one of the things this film has, which comes up quite a lot is that like, it's, it's definitely more Bond films have always had comedic elements to them. But I think this is one of the ones where it really like goes in and you can start to see that every scene more or less has a little comedy bit to it. Um, or at least, at least more than ever before. Uh, and in this case, the scene is where he's just about to try and, grab the belly but uh, the the gold bullet out of the belly, uh, her belly button and um the angry men come in behind and give him a whack and that causes him to like accidentally swallow it and you get this sort of like really we're talking about uh, Roger Moore being hammy like his eyes bulging as he's just swallowed this uh bit of gold and it very quickly gets into a little fight scene between these um these guys and i kind of last podcast i said i didn't quite find Roger Moore very good in these fight scenes um, which is why they didn't really try and do too many. I think this one, straight off the bat, I think this one's a lot better. I think this one, he seems a bit more believable in actually being uh, a tougher guy. I think partly because he's maybe not quite as uh, like preen and, and tailored perfectly. Um, you know, the jacket flies open, there's like smashing and everything like that. And also because like, by the end of the scene, he's actually bleeding, which is like uh, it's quite a... Like, oh, actually, he did get hurt in this. Like, he actually did get attacked and he's bleeding from it. So, yeah, I think this whole little fight scene, it's really its really not much at all, right? There's no interesting ways out of it. There's nothing really interesting in the way he deals with these these villains. But I, I kind of, the whole scene itself, I liked Roger Moore being a bit more believable as Bond in this regard. Well, this film in general does the same thing as Live and Let Die, where they just don't focus on physical fights so much. You just don't get many of them. But this one feels like they did focus on it a bit more. Although I can't, like, there might be one more in the entire film. Well, there's one main scene in a certain dojo or something, but that's again a bit different. Mm. Uh, so this is the only kind of traditional Bond versus Goon ones. And I agree, I actually quite like this one. I actually thought it was quite solid. I think the fact that Bond kind of loses for most of it is more of an even fight, makes it a little bit more believable. Yeah, it's not just Bond overpowering three guys. They throw him around. He gets hit a lot. We got a lot of judo chops in this scene. Oh yeah, and we get the old move that I don't understand. The old I think like you hold your hand and then like throw your elbow into someone. Like we get oh, a lot of that. Yeah, I think I know what you're referring to. Yeah, yeah, just some weird elbow moves. So we get these like clearly fake moves. So it's not supposed to be like intense and a proper physical fight. But yeah, I think the fact that they lean into Roger being a bit more of a, not a clumsy Bond, because that's not fair, but someone who's kind of losing, but still finds a way to pull it out at the end is probably a much better style uh, for all of this. Because Bond gets like smashed with a glass bottle and stuff. And, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's nice. I think it's a solid little fight scene. And there's some quite nice shots as well, where there's one where they just kind of, they lean on, well, they have one shot that's quite continuous for a good portion of this, where they just keep panning left and right as the characters are being thrown across the, the room. And it kind of makes you feel it a little bit more than what they normally do, which is just showing being thrown and then cut to a different angle and then cut to a different one. But this one, you actually kind of see a bit more of the back and forth. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's actually pretty good. Yeah, yeah, I did like it. It was, uh, as we've said, there's, I don't think there's really... <clears throat> Stunt-wise in this film, stunts aren't amazing. This isn't really a stunt, but it's it's still something uh, to get the film going, which I liked. Yeah, nice and simple, but effective. Uh, but outside, basically, uh, after knocking out the three gentlemen and having the bullet 
inside him, <laughs> I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's a big gang of people trying to get in. They're like, oh, blah, 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 we're going to rubble, rubble, rubble. Uh, and the door is blocked by the, the bald man. So Bond just goes around the back and leaves. And the woman's like, where's my charm gone? And he Bond finds a taxi and the guy's like, you want to go to the hotel, mister? And he's like, no, take me to the nearest pharmacy. <laughs> <laughs> Which, yeah, we don't then cut to a pharmacy, but it was quite a, a nice little, you know, meant to be kind of funny, I guess, but a nice little nod to this idea that they were clearly leaning heavily into of, yeah, Bond got kind of injured in this fight not in a super serious way but like yeah he's not doing well he's got blood coming out of his mouth he needs to go and get some meds or something well i read it as that he also needs to get that out of his system so oh yeah of course <laughs> he needs something to yeah make it pass through ah uh, yeah that yeah i guess yeah that's probably more what they were going for <laughs> which is which is like a little gag in itself really yeah just the image of Bond, like, on the toilet. <laughs> oh, no, no, I don't know. <laughs> no. I mean, it's not a nice thing that to do, especially because then you have to, have to pass it on to Q and all that. Yeah. Let's not think about that. Yeah, they didn't include that in this film. I don't know if you check the deleted scenes, because I know <laughs> no. you like to. <laughs> there was nothing like that, thankfully. Hmm. That's good. So after that little fight scene, we cut straight to Bond in the Q branch with Q and I think it was the same guy... We saw in M's office, maybe. I don't know. They all, they all look the same. These men. Yeah, he has like a, a, Yeah, he has this mustache man who's just consistent, like Q's assistant. But he doesn't really say much. He's just kind of always there sometimes. And he was in yeah. the office. Now he's here, and you see him later in the film as well. He's just always there for some reason. Yeah, um, and they are investigating the bullet that Bond has now got for them, and and they're kind of looking at it through a microscope, and they've been doing uh, tests on it to kind of trace the bullet using. Uh, you know what it's made of and like gold and and nickels in there and that sort of stuff and um, trying to kind of guess where it's from all while this is happening there's like a I was going to say there's like a a joke happening in the background like a visual joke because you know we're in Q branch there's going to be something that happens something's going to explode or some wacky thing in the background but uh, to me all that happens is they just blow a hole in this wall like there's a brick wall behind them and then over the course of the scene it just blows up i didn't actually spot if there was a gag involved with that i didn't see a gag no at some point as they're talking they hear an explosion look to see a wall destroyed and then just get back to it yeah like you'd expect it to be i don't know someone being like ejected from something or like a, it's a it's a boom box actually that's a later film never mind um or maybe a sandwich or something maybe some sort of sandwich <laughs> gag lunch yes yes that would be a good part <laughs> Uh, anyway, that's besides the point. So what they're I actually can't talking wait about... till we get to that gag. I can't wait. <laughs> that's just going to be the whole podcast. Yeah. Um, what they're actually talking about in the scene is yeah, tracing the bullet, and so they can they can work out that it's like a four point two millimeter gun, and Bond's very quickly kind of like you know, Bond always likes to be right, and he's like, yeah, there's no such thing as a four point two millimeter gun, and kind of explain to him that you know it's probably a an unregistered gun, it's like a custom made thing, and. Um, that's why it's difficult to track and trace. And then using yeah, using the component like the alloy, they can these two men, Q and this other guy. I think his name, I did write down his name. His name is Colthorpe. There you go. Oh, okay. Uh they kind of discuss it and eventually work out that it's probably from some guy called Lazar, who is a bullet maker in Macau. Um, which is where Bond's gonna head to next. And I do kind of like this scene because this is going to sound kind of cheesy, but I kind of liked that Q had someone to sort of like geek out with. <laughs> like Q's always just been there talking to M about something or talking to Bond. You know, Bond doesn't care about the gadgets or doesn't care about them. Like, you know, he was saying bring them back in one piece sort of thing. Whereas, you know, Q's there and he's like, oh, that's a good idea. Cole Thorpe, or, mm, maybe. And it's like, oh, Q's got, you know, Q has got some friends. It's not just, it's not just who we've seen before, like M and Bond. There are more. Hmm. Well, Bond was like the third or the odd man out, really, in yeah. that scene. Because yeah. they were both very excited and interested in this bullet and figuring it out. And Bond's just kind of awkwardly standing there waiting for them to get to that point. And they just kind of, yeah, Bond is usually the knowledgeable person, but he just kind of actually doesn't know. Because they say Lazar, and he was like, who's Lazar? And it's like, the chap who made the bullet, 007. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's exasperated. Yeah. yeah. But we see Q a few times in this film, and it, it's really nice. Like, I, it's really nice we're back in Q Lab. 
even if it's for quite a simple and basic scene like they are making a very conscious effort to bring back all those kind of old familiar elements even though we've probably only seen q lab property once before this point this might yeah. be the second time ever yeah i mean yeah we would have seen it in goldfinger but then what else I think there might have been a shot of it with Q on the phone or something, but uh, actually yeah. Bond going to it, I think this is the second time ever we've seen this kind of underground concrete base where they're testing stuff. Wow. Yeah, it's very odd. But yeah, there's a real effort for that in this film, and I kind of, kind of do appreciate that. It's quite interesting that we get that for the second Roger Moore film. You feel like a lot of this stuff should have been in Live and Let Die. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. Mm. Yeah, and it's, yeah, as you say, it's nice to see Bond not be not be the smartest one in the room and actually being uh, kind of put in his place by these two. So, yes. So now Bond has a name, Lazar, a bullet maker. And where did you say this this guy was? Uh, I thought it was Macau. I, I have no idea. Like, I have no idea. What, I completely missed it. So basically, this film is largely uh, takes place in Asia and different countries in Asia. But as you mentioned before like with the opening scene and stuff, they just kind of cut to these places. Yeah. So some of them they do set up and they do usually mention what it is, but it's so, so easy to miss. And because I don't know the the continent too well, there's a lot of times where I was just like, oh, it's just someplace in Asia. I don't actually know where this is, Which and this was one of them. There's no helpful wording, you know, like the last film. We're just left to our own devices. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but in case you couldn't tell we were in Asia, uh, we get a, a remix of the Bond theme, which has some of those Asian, uh, Asian kind of elements. Mm. Uh, and I, I kind of liked it. I felt like we've heard it before with the uh, You Only Live Twice. I think I might have liked this one a bit better because it felt a little bit more, maybe not subtle because it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't know. It, it didn't bother me so much. It was Maybe it's because it was earlier in the film and it was just Bond visiting an Asian place, but... Uh, I'm assuming some of this is because John Barry was like, oh, I need to write some Asian music, right? Give me <laughs> give me an Asian instrument. I'll just play the Bond theme on it. There we go. Done. Okay, cool. What? Next scene. Yeah, I mean, if you had three weeks to do it, I'd, <laughs> I'd do the same. Yeah. Although I think we get more original music in this film than Live and Let Die. Do you think so? I don't know. <laughs> that sounds right. Or, or like... So, as you mentioned, the Man with the Golden Gun theme is used in this track, or in this score, but it feels like we got more different variety of tracks in this one than the last one, just because they didn't play the theme all the time. Yeah, I know what, you're probably right with that. Yeah. Well, now Bond is in this place, uh, and goes up to this store, and there's a family eating, uh, a mum and two kids eating a load of noodles, and he does his confidence... <laughs> just an overconfident act of just speaking in pure english and just being like hello i'm james bond i'm looking for a bullet maker called lazar maybe you've heard of him and they just stare blankly at him just not interested um i get the opinion oh, i get the impression that they probably do understand him and it's more just like we do not care about this english man who's just so full of himself um, <laughs> yeah they just they, they just want to get back to their noodles yeah, it's pure comedy with the way they're all eating noodles quickly and then stop. And then once Bond leaves, they start quickly eating noodles again. But I can get behind these smaller moments. It's it's the same type of comedy we saw in Live and Let Die of Bond being out of his element, only rather than being in Harlem, now he's in this Asian kind of back alley shop. Yep, and I guess, you know, we've although Bond knows Japanese, he did not learn Chinese. We, we didn't get he needs that book now from Money Penny. Like yeah, they didn't cover it in Oriental languages. <laughs> no, <laughs> course. sadly not. He, he skipped that day. So, yeah, so basically while he's asking these people, uh, a man comes out, and it's Lazar. And he's very happy to see Bond. He said, come in, come in, your reputation precedes you, and says, it would be the proudest moment of my career to make you a, a gun and, and bullet and things like that, so... Lazar knows who Bond is and is very happy that he's here and it just assumes he wants some, some guns and, and bullets. So Lazar shows off or shows Bond a rifle that he has set up at a range, asks Bond to fire the gun, of which he slightly misses the bullseye. And Bond's like, that's slightly off. And the guy was saying like, yes, it's intentionally slightly off because I made it for someone with two fingers. 
uh, because I, I special make all my my guns uh, like this, mm. which then leads to Bond just asking like, "Hey, I'm looking for ammunition, maybe some gold bullets, huh?" Again, not so <laughs> subtly get trying to get information. Yeah, I could. Yeah, you can you can just picture the eyebrow raise with that. <laughs> it's just right there. Mm. And uh, straight away then to Scaramanga, like I'm looking for gold bullets, and I want to. I I think you make him bullets. And Bond starts leaning on the gun, the rifle that set up, while Lazar's like, I can't do that. I can't tell you anything. And, well, there's also a thing about Bond being an assassin and things like that. And Bond kind of challenges him, like saying, oh, do you, you know, about making these bullets and guns and stuff. And he's just like, well, bullets don't kill people. It's it's up to people what they kind of do, want to do. Yeah. But eventually Bond, he's not giving him information. So Bond points the gun and it's like, I'm aiming at your groin. Uh, so you better tell me what I need to know. Of which Lazar saying, like, I don't know the guy. So one thing about Scaramango that I don't think I mentioned or we mentioned before is that no one knows what he looks like. Which is a little bit odd. Because they have this whole trait of, like, no, what does Scaramango look like? Nobody knows. He could be anyone. But the whole film starts off with you just seeing him clear as day and quite a lot. So I felt like there's a little bit of a mishmash between the way that he's perceived in the world of no one knows what he even looks like is a shadow and the film just kind of like, yeah, there he is. Like they, they make no effort to kind of try and hide his identity and, and play into that idea of him being very well hidden. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. Because um, I'm just trying to picture like if they had gone down that route, let's say they'd done the intro of the film a bit differently where... I don't know, they never fully revealed his face or something. Like, that would have been pretty cool to have later on in the film, not knowing who might be watching Bond sort of thing. Um, obviously, it's Christopher Lee, so they're going to want to show him straight away because he's a big star. But, yeah, that is, that is true. They they don't know what he looks like, but they all everyone seems to know he has a third nipple. <laughs> yeah, he leaked that out. Apparently. <laughs> it's proud. Yeah. But I do like the approach they took in terms of we get to see a lot of Christopher Lee as Garamanga. Like, that's great. Like, they take advantage of it. It's just, uh, yeah, maybe it's because of the book it was like that way. But yeah, just a bit of a mismatch. It just doesn't quite work so well. You don't buy the way people kind of talk about him just because it's like, yeah, he's the nipple guy. I, I know. I know. That dude. <laughs> the man with the third nipple. Yeah. That's, there we go. Fixed it. Done. Lulu's on board. She'll do oh. an alternative version. In fact, she's right here to sing it now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lulu. Uh, yes, see you later, Lulu. Back to the film. So, uh, Lazar... <laughs> Bond is aiming a gun at Lazar's groin. He then fires. And then Bond's like, you're right. It is a little bit off. It's just an inch too low. Of which eventually Lazar breaks and shows Bond the bullets, saying, here's the golden bullets that I've been asked to make for Scaramanga and saying I never met meet anyone he just says or he's been told to go to a casino and drop them off so we we cut to Bond and Lazar at a casino where he exchanges the bullets yeah I don't know it's kind of I mean I guess it's a real casino but it's kind of cool what they're doing like with the, the little baskets that come down from like another floor and then that's how they're doing the the drop off of the bullets and then yeah, it's just kind of like a, that's one of the things I do like about this film is that, I mean, yes, we've had we've had you only live twice, which was similarly sort of you know set in Asia, but this one is showing off different places, and I do like that it does go all in with with this setting, and you do get a lot of cool locations like this, and and you know uh, nighttime shots with all the lights and stuff like that. It's um it's it's nice, and it's also a, a refreshing change from um, forests and and jungles and stuff like we saw with Live and Let Die. Uh, and I think actually, I, I think the book, because there is, you know, this is based on the book, even though heavily adapted, I'm sure. But I think the book was based in Jamaica. So it's like they wanted to avoid Jamaica again. So I'm glad they did that. Oh, yeah, very smart. I complained so much about America before and it is really appreciated what they do here because it just takes place in a lot of different uh, Asian countries, basically. Mm. And it is really refreshing. Like, yes, they did Japan, but Asia's a huge place with lots of different kind of 
countries and cultures and things like that so it's nice that they've gone back and they never go to japan or anything like that instead we get like hong kong and thailand and stuff like that and it, it helped separate it i think the the setting was maybe it's not as strong as say japan was some of that just due to the way the film is shot and kind of presented but yeah it's refreshing it's nice that they finally mixed it up for this one yeah so in the casino bond watches uh, the the drop off of the bullets and it's picked up by uh, this lady this lady, it's the same lady that we saw at the beginning of the film uh, on the beach with Scaramanga. Uh, so he follows her and she eventually gets onto. Am I right in thinking these are called hydrofoils? I think there's, a, there's like a sign at some point in the film. I have no clue what a hydrofoil is. It looks like, like a bit like a hoverboat. But um, he gets onto uh, the hydrofoil and, and follows her and just keeps an eye on her. And this is a bit strange because like then it's sort of you get the audio of um, the, I guess it's almost like a tour as well or something. Like someone's given all this information about where they're heading to, which is uh, Hong Kong Harbour. And on the way, they're like pointing out all the stuff. Like on your left, you'll see Kowloon and on your right, you'll see this. And then one of the places that they point out is that there's this wreckage of uh, a ship that's called the Queen Elizabeth, um, which... I had to. I mean, I was so curious about this. I was like, "Well, I've got to look this up afterwards." And yeah, like it did actually. That's a real ship that actually did sink there. And I guess when they were filming, it was still there. So they thought, "Let's let's include it in the plot somehow," which is kind of a cool idea because it does come back. Um, and so yeah, uh, the boat reaches to Hong Kong Harbor, and just as uh, she gets away, this lady who's picked up the bullets, just as she gets away um, in a taxi or in a car. Uh, and Bond's about to follow her in a taxi, we get the introduction uh, of Goodnight. Is that name Mary? Is it Mary Goodnight? Yeah, I don't know if they say it, but... Yeah, it Mary, Mary Goodnight, who I'm just going to... I just really want to get this out. I was one, uh, Having finished watching this film, like one of my notes was just like, this is one of the most annoying characters in the Bond franchise so far. Oh, what? If not the most annoying character to me. I'm really surprised. I thought if anyone on this planet would be a Mary Goodnight defender, I thought Joe. Would. I really? thought you would be it. I can't stand her in this film. Wow, that's surprising. I don't think she's the worst character, but she's definitely the most annoying character, or frustrating anyway. Um, so yeah, she shows up, and basically, I think I'm right in thinking she's a. Uh, she works for in like the mi6 she's like a she has like a intelligence post in in macau so she's basically bond's contact in this in this area of the world uh unfortunately <laughs> and um she's there and like gets in the way immediately like gets in the way of bond following uh the lady in this in this green rolls royce it turns out to be uh so bond and what what i kind of what's quite interesting about this is that immediately off the bat yeah, like she's got in the way of Bond tailing this lady and he's annoyed. But you you really get the sense that Bond just doesn't really like this lady straight away. She hasn't really even done that much. And he's so he's so like sharp with her. Um, and it, it comes up later on as well, but that's because she makes lots of stupid decisions. So I don't blame him. I got the impression that they had worked together before. Yeah. So it does feel quite harsh because yeah, like you're right, Roger Moore or James Bond is just so annoyed at her like straight away like instantly uh and it is a little bit confusing because it seems like they have this established relationship but they don't really do a very good job of kind of catching you up on it you just get a lot of like good night being dumb and just kind of laughing uh, then bond just being annoyed but then bond just kind of switches away from that so it's like they're old friends but you don't quite get what that relationship is uh, yeah, yeah straight totally. away like he's annoyed but she just kind of rolls it off like there's some self-awareness there um, that she did she did kind of mess up but she's like ha 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 oh james <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, and i do like i like that attempt of having some sort of history between the characters i think you're right though i don't think it's it's handled very well that's i mean that's just how many times have we said that in these in these podcasts where there's a good idea but not really just it's not implemented very well because th this is another example of it I, I i like the idea of seeing these past uh past characters that bond would have had contact with or flings with in this case i don't know but um yeah just just stupid just annoying anyway um 
Bond asks her to phone in to trace a green Rolls Royce and she sort of laughs it off saying that um, a green Rolls Royce, like that's impossible sort of thing because it turns out that that's the company car of, of one of the hotels in Hong Kong. So there's tons of them basically. But also they know exactly where the lady was going. I can't remember the name of the hotel, but this big fancy hotel where they eventually get to. And I think, I don't think it's ever really explained. I think Bond just goes up to a... Uh, uh, like a doorman there and, and probably just uh, gives him a bit of money or something and, and gets some information about what room. I don't know how he exactly worked out what room she's in, but um, he manages to find her room in this hotel. I think he leaves he leaves good night in the car. I don't know what he says to her. Probably something rude. <laughs> probably something where he's being annoyed with her. Uh, but yeah, he's he's off to go and try and find this woman. Hmm. So I actually don't hate good night but maybe that's for a different time because she she's the bond girl right like she is the bond girl for this film yeah oh yeah we have secondary bond girls like normal but she is the main one that bond is with by the you can tell who the actual bond girl is by who bond is with at the end of the film yeah totally so yeah so bond enters this hotel and he gets a bottle of champagne i, I don't really know where from and we have these kind of people who work in the hotel saying like, ah, can I help you? Let me carry that. And Bond's like, well, no, I want to, I'm planning a surprise uh, for my other half. Uh, but you don't, you know, I want to hold the champagne, but you can get this door open for me. And he's like, yes, sir. Very good. And the guy just opens like the hotel door, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yep. which I kind of like. It's It's nice. It's. But it is one of those where it's like it's a very James Bond moment because the only reason it kind of works is because it's him. Like on paper, it's it's ridiculous that someone would kind of do that. But the fact that he is who he is and dresses the way he is and holds the way he is, like it's one of those moments where people just kind of buy into it and just help him out, even though on paper it's a ridiculous thing to do to just let somebody into a hotel room. Yeah, different times, I suppose. Well, actually, no, I think because like... I'd hope they wouldn't have done that even in the 70s. So, no, not different times. Just Bond. Just Bond. It's just Bond. So he gets into the hotel room. He gets the his gun out and starts looking around. But he hears the shower. The shower is going. And he has a little peek, because of course he does, and sees the woman that he was following before is in there showering. So he just kind of stands at the door, uh, puts his gun away, starts smiling... And then basically just watches her shower for a bit. So there is mm. like kind of blurred glass or whatever. So you, you can clearly see her there, but it's you know not clear or anything. And then eventually just says good afternoon out loud. Of which she correctly just kind of freaks out. <laughs> it's like, what? what? Yeah. And gets a gun. Uh, because apparently she had a gun. So she points the gun at him. And asks for a robe. Bond then gets very close to her to hand around the robe. So he's just kind of enjoying this. She's quite horrified. Like there's a strange man in my room and I and he and I'm naked and he's watching me shower. And he's just kind of being all like smug and just really creepy and quite horrible, to be honest. It's and, yeah, yeah, like for, for being in that situation, she handles it very well. <laughs> What's actually happening. But I think what the film was trying to do here or at least what it reminded me of, is the scene from Thunderball, where, uh, is it Volpe? I think that's the character's name, where she's in the bath, and, and Bond, you know, she asks for some clothes, and Bond just gives her the shoes, like, as a little bit of a gag. I, that's the impression I got from this, where she's like, give me my robe. So he does, but then he just stands there and stays there. Um, but it just doesn't work as well. I don't know what it is. I think you're right. It doesn't, it's not, it's not the same sort of fun. It's, it's just creepy. I think it's just too long, to be honest. And where it goes as well, like the next sec part of this scene doesn't help. But in that one, Volpe broke into his room and got into the bath, I believe. Yeah. And then Bond just kind of has a, it's you know, it's more playful. She asked for clothes and stuff. But she, she broke into the room and then it's just a quick moment of like, here's your shoes for something to put on and then just sits there. And that's it. You're done. Like, that's the joke. This one, you got to have like, you really got to sit in this moment of a man just staring at a woman in the shower and doesn't know he's there. And when she does know, just keeps kind of staying there. It's just all... This is awful. And it's kind of surprising because I think Roger Moore 
so far already, kind of Bond girls and the way he treats women is like worse than Sean Connery, which I find very surprising. Mm, yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I can see why you think that with where this scene goes, but yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think. It's just a different, it's just a very different people. Like Roger Moore can't get away with the same things that Sean did in terms of just like the way he acts them out. And so when they're still trying to do this sort of stuff where we, you know, in the scene later on, he does get quite physical with, with this lady. It doesn't, not that that's ever good, but like this feels like it's just a extra wrong. Hmm. Well, I'm not saying Sean Connery was a saint, but it's like what we talked about before with Dr. No from Usher With Love, where he has like a girlfriend and, or someone that he kind of meets up with and there's a more playful back and forth between the two. And then, you know, we get, Bond girls, like the fundable Bond girl, who I can't remember her name, like feels a little bit more developed and stuff. So it just seems like the trend with Bond girls, I think we talked about this last week, is that they've just kind of gone completely downhill and have been quite terrible. And now we're just getting these type of scenes still. And it's just all a bit like, oh, this is, it's just interesting that this is the era of Bond where I feel like women in these films of Bond girls are treated the worst and it's the most uncomfortable and actually like, the first three or four films was actually better than that. Mm. Yeah. This eventually leads to her putting on the robe and she's like, you should leave, please. Of which, I actually did laugh at this bit, where she goes to call reception to, I think, basically say there's a man in my room or something like that and gets distracted and puts down the phone because Bond just starts playing with the golden bullets. It's not one of those moments where he's just like a kid it's like yeah. how Sean Connery with the tape and stuff in Diamonds Are Forever. Just, yeah, Just exactly. Bond childish picking stuff up and just messing with it because he can. Yeah, yeah. I do think... Um, but actually, no, I'll, I'll, I'll wait to say that bit. You carry on. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll get we'll get through this because th- this gets no better. So she... Yeah, she puts down the phone because Bond's playing the Golden Bullets and that's Garamanga's bullets and she's there to deliver, deliver them. So Bond then goes to return the bullets of which... Bond then smacks her gun away and then grabs her arm and then pins her on the bed and then kind of is pulling her arm back and have her pinned down and he's like, where are the bullets are going? And she's like, you're hurting my arm. And then he's like, I'll break your arm. Uh, which eventually she's like, it's Scaramanga. Like, I'm giving them to Scaramanga and explains, I don't work for him. I'm, well, basically his lover. Um, and we do the the horizontal tango uh, every time he goes to kill uh, somebody. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, wait a minute, what? what? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me a PG for everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, he then uh, is like, where is, where is Scaramanga? Of which she's like, I don't know. And then he like slams her and stuff and is still kind of like wrestling her. Uh, which eventually, again, you get another funny line. You just can't appreciate it because of what's happening here uh, of where she's like, gives a description of Scaramanga. It's like, what does he look like? And she's like, she's he's tall, slim and dark. Of which Bond's like, well, so's my aunt. That's not very helpful. <laughs> I, yeah, I like that. It's a funny I, I line. Say, it's just in a better scene. Yeah. I would have loved. I, I, what I was going to say, I don't find this scene as bad i don't actually find it terrible like the whole what he's doing here mainly because it, it, in in the context of this plot so far like he's got a hitman on him like bond's gonna die right that's what he thinks he thinks scaramanga is coming after him to kill him so like the stakes are high basically it's not just like i think maybe in other bond films it's you know well i suppose it might be like end of the world plot still so it still stakes are high but this one feels very personal so i can like that makes sense why he's wanting this information and he will do this sort of stuff it's i, I think the the problem is is that i don't think roger moore is is very good at that um and i think they eventually do learn that and they don't really have these sort of scenes with roger anymore going forward uh, but i think overall the scene is okay for me ah i just no <laughs> I'm not with you on this one, I'm afraid. Fair enough. I think the problem is that they're trying to combine two things. And we've probably already covered this, but they're trying to combine Tough Bond who's trying to get info with 
Bond the charmer who's cheeky chappy or sexy lady time. They're trying to do that in the same scene, like very quickly after each other and combine them and just it lasts ages as well. And it just feels so bad. Like keep those things separate. You can have a scene where Bond is being tough and trying to get info and you can have a scene where he's kind of being a bit naughty or something but she's like oh tee hee or whatever you can do that stuff but don't put them in the same scene like this don't combine them it just makes it so awkward and weird where you have to equate bond the creep staring at someone in the shower and then bond kind of wrestling and hurting that same person and threatening to break their arm like in the same scene it's, it's just too much and if they separated it a little bit more i think it would have helped but i yeah, I think this is quite terrible overall. Mm. I mean, Bond's not a very nice person <laughs> at the end of the day. Well, that's true when yeah. you think about it. So eventually uh, we find out that after a good old arm twisting that she's going to take the bullet to Scar- or she's going to take the bullet to Scaramanga but she also says that Scaramanga is going to go to the Bottoms Up Club. Uh, I can't remember if she says that sh- he has a hit on someone there or not. I think, I think it might just be he has a date there. Yeah, because these the bullets date. are you know yeah. for his hit, his assassination attempt. But they, I don't think they quite put that together. But yeah, uh, she says like, oh, that's where he's going to be. So Bond says you should go and take the bullets to Scaramanga to make sure he does show up there. Or where she then just starts pouring champagne and gives her a glass and then like has a little toast between the two and she's like oh let's drink to that or something and and this is when bond is saying like you won't tell scaramanga i was here because if he knows that i know or knows this happened then scaramanga might end up shooting you and then they have a little champagne it's like oh what a, what a terrible end <laughs> like this is what I'm saying about combining two different scenes. Like, he then jumps to being, trying to be, I guess, intimidating, but charming at the same time. It's just like, just pick a lane. Yeah, maybe, maybe maybe not the best time for a, a little tipple after that. That's true. Mm. And then this kind of leads to the transition of, yeah. So I think the reason why they actually are having a champagne is for a joke, where we're saying, it's called the Bottoms Up Club. So... He's like, let's drink to that. And they ching the glasses and then say, bottoms up, as in drinking. And then it cuts to a woman's bottom. <laughs> up. Up. Yes. Uh, in the club itself. So <laughs> it, it's so, like, so on the nose. <laughs> Bond yeah. says bottom ups. Here's a woman's, like, ass zoomed in. There it is. Let's it's all probably... have a good laugh, I guess. It's probably the most sort of, uh, even by Bond standards, like they like to have a bit of fun and that sort of innuendos and whatnot. But that is like the most overt example thus far, I would say. Like just this right is where there. John Barry put the slide whistle on the wrong scene. I think <laughs> yes. this is we should have like. <laughs> That's so true. Next time, John. If he had four weeks, I'm sure he would have had it. <laughs> just those that last little bit of time, that moment of creativity would have hit him yeah yeah so in this bottom up bottoms up club uh we see it's a very short scene actually inside the club um <laughs> thankfully i suppose uh before we get any more of that um we just see a very quick scene of a man sitting at the bar where this, this lady was um ordering a drink sort of thing and and then another man or smoking and, and another man comes and sits next to him and they sort of have a quick glance at each other sort of thing but that's that's really it. There's no ex- explanation of who these people are. Um, you are just left to see that. And it then moves on quickly to Bond outside. Outside the Bottoms Up Club. Sort of uh, scouting the area. Trying to keep an eye out for Scaramanga. And this is a bit of a strange little scene now. Because Bond is basically opposite the club. On the opposite side of the street. In the doorway to uh, like a camera shop or something. Because it has, like, I remember seeing Kodak on the in the background um so whilst in this little area he's looking inside the shop window front of which there are cameras and uh video feeds on tvs of like the live camera shot so you get bond um you know keeping an eye on the bombs up club and then he goes and, and has a look in the camera and kind of 
checks himself out, which I thought was quite uh, quite a nice little touch. You know, even in these situations, Bond wants to make sure that he looks good. So he's there just sorting out his collar and all that. Um, and whilst that happens, he spots uh, Nick Knack. Nick Knack comes up to him. And I missed this at first, but I guess what, what this is, is like Nick Knack's making fun of him because Nick Knack also does that. He kind of looks in the camera and and glances up to Bond. And it's just a kind of, you know, it's a bit like, what? What's going on? Um, and I think, am I right in thinking like the general idea of that is that he's just distracting Bond, basically? Well, Nick Knack's there for a specific purpose, so he's also scoping out the out the club. So yeah, I think Nick Knack's just messing with him. Just messing with him, just, just making fun of Bond, you know, because he, sometimes he doesn't need to take it down a peg or two. Um, and as that's all happening, you do get shots of Scaramanga. Not very big shots, he's kind of like peeking through a a blind or something, um, watching the the entrance to the Bottoms Up Club. Um, and after this whole little knick-knack thing, Bond, I think, I, this is a bit I didn't get, like Bond looks up and then that makes him walk over. I don't know whether something was missing. I don't know what actually causes him to go over and start investigating. I think it's the time, because I think he has a specific time, but we get a, a shot. And it zoomed in on his, I think, a Rolex, his watch. I want to say it might be the same watch from the last film. Oh, okay. I might be wrong on that because it's very quick, but you do, you know, he's looking at his watch and stuff and they actually do have a shot which is just zoomed in on the watch. I think that was probably more for the brand deal for the Rolex probably. But right. I want to say it might be the same one. So I think it, it's implied that he's been there for a while. So eventually he just says, okay, I'm going to go into this club and see what's going on. Fair enough. I was trying to, I was like rewinding it thinking like, is there someone leaving or, because at one point there's like a little, um, <clears throat> whatever those things are called, like the, what people carry, like ride on. Anyway, that's besides the point. So Bond starts to walk over um, and that's just as he's about to go in, you think Scaramanga's going to take the shot. Uh, but then just as, yeah, he's about to go in the door, two men come out. It's the same two men that we just saw inside the club and Scaramanga actually shoots one of them, not Bond. Surprise, surprise. So, yeah, Bond falls to the floor, um, grabs his gun, and turns out that the guy that's got shot and the guy that was sitting there, um, well, I guess it's actually not revealed who that is yet. I'm sort of getting ahead of myself there. But, um, yeah, it's a guy from inside. And the other man with him is a cop who very quickly spots Bond holding a gun and arrests him. And whilst he's doing all this sort of stuff, you do see Nick Knack, like you say, Nick Knack was there for a specific reason too. Uh, he kind of comes up to their body whilst uh, this other man's distracted. And and then, yeah, the guy's like, hey, step away from there. Like, don't touch that sort of thing. <laughs> don't, <laughs> I'll put that down. Yeah, don't touch that. Um, and then, yeah, so he walks off. And yeah, it's, it's kind of a bit of a strange scene. I mean, it's obviously like a subversion, right? Because you think Scaramanga's there aiming for Bond and it's not. So you think, what's going on? It's okay, I guess. I think it could have... It wasn't very... I feel like with this sort of setup, it could have maybe been done a bit more dramatically. But yeah, the point is that Bond actually is not the target, at least not then anyway, and he gets arrested and um, driven away. I think this now might be a good time to say and basically made the exact same point we made in the last episode about Live and Let Die, that this film feels very similar to that one in terms of his pacing and a way a lot of the scenes play out. And this yeah. is just another one of those scenes similar to Live and Let Die where just, it's just a low-key scene. Um, so this film is about the same length as Live and Let Die, about two hours or just over two hours. And it's paced in that same way. So And it comes with some of the same caveats and the same problems where you just get a lot of scenes like this where it's not really bad. It's just kind of a bit whatever. Um, and this film is unfortunately kind of filled with those type of scenes uh, yeah and, and this is just another one it's a shame as well because with a, when everyone talks about this film a common thing is oh it's the one with christopher lee because everyone knows christopher lee he had such a long career and he was in so many big standout films and franchises and he's not really in this very much really i mean no bond villain really is in the film very much and it's kind of like this is one of those things where, yeah, he's he's in this scene, but like doesn't really do much. It's not really, I don't know, wasted. I think just wasted 
I think he has a decent amount of screen time. I think it's more just relative to the rest of the film, where it's just, it's over two hours, and just like last week, it, it just shouldn't have been. It should have been edited down. So you still get a lot of scenes with him in. It's just because this film is so kind of padded with other stuff, which doesn't involve him, I think it kind of dilutes those scenes a little bit because you're just spending all these extra scenes that don't really involve him. Um, but if you kind of edited it down and kept all the Christopher Lee scenes in there, I think you would probably get that more of that feeling of, wow, he was in this quite a bit. Or there was quite a lot of scenes because there are a decent amount of scenes with him in. Yeah, I, I suppose there are, there are like there are later on scenes with with other characters. What I what I would have liked more is scenes with him and Bond, which obviously we get at the end, but just not given the theming of this film, where it is Scaramanga and Bond and and the sort of parallel between them. I don't know. It just feels like they're never really in the film together enough. But that's later on anyway. Yeah, that's that's fair enough. I think that's a definitely a fair point. Like it's kind of portrayed as rather than Bond versus Scaramanga, it's more like Bond is doing his investigating, Scaramanga is just in control the entire time. Mm. And then he does his cocky villain thing, and that's when we have the final showdown, just to get ahead a little bit. But most of this film is Scaramanga just doing what he wants to do, and Bond is just kind of cluelessly trying to stop him and just failing for most of it. Yeah. So yeah, so the the undercover cop arrests Bond, puts him in a car, and takes him away just as more police is showing up. So while Bond is in the car, he's like, "Can I see an identity card?" Which he'll say, "We'll we'll get to that. Don't worry about that." And instead of going to the police station, they go to a dock and get on a, a small little boat and drive out into the the harbor. Uh, at the same time, we get Scaramanga and Nicknack because they were both there, get onto this big old wooden ship. Which, yeah. I mean, I just thought it was a pirate boat, really. Like, it's a <laughs> 1700s, maybe 1800s style boat. Like, it's a really old-timey sort of boat. It looks good, though. Oh, it looks it, great. It does, it does kind of stand out. <laughs> like, it's not the most uh, uh, secretive of, of um, methods to travel. Do you remember what the boat was called? It, I think the type of boat is called a junk. A junk. Okay, yeah, they, I think they called it a junk at one point. But I don't... Yeah, that's as much as I know. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's just one of... If you've seen Pirates of the Caribbean, you know what this boat looks like. It's basically one of them. And this is, was one of the times where I actually quite liked the music. I think when we get the these slower, more, I guess, atmospheric... Maybe that's not the word, but these kind of slower pieces, I think they do actually work quite well. And the film does have quite a few kind of moments like that. It, You know, they're low key, but I thought they were quite good for being kind of low key. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Uh, so then we see Scaramanga go into the boat or the ship, the junk, if you will. And we see the woman. Now, I never wrote down this woman's name and I don't. I'm, I'm assuming somebody says it at some point, but she's a pretty core character to the film, the woman that Bond was in the hotel room with before, because it's the same woman as here. But I don't know. If, I never picked up on the name. I did, but I couldn't tell you when. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I put that her name's Anders. Anders. Yeah. Because normally they would give them a silly name, like Goodnight, right? But I guess they saved the silliest name for Goodnight. And, and chew me get, later. Yeah, I guess so. There's no kissy kissy or something. That's, no. That's what I was expecting. Uh, yeah, so this... Well, again, I'm not going to remember that name. <laughs> uh, so she's she's in there and Scaramanga kind of meets up with her. And we have a bit of an odd scene where Scaramanga gets his gun out and just kind of gives her a stroke with it. Mm. So... I mean, it's an uncomfortable scene, but it's supposed to be uncomfortable because the whole idea is that this woman is actually not... She's not like in love with Scaramanga or something like that. It's more of a prisoner type relationship. And she explains that later. But we kind of get a very strong hint of it here where Scaramanga goes to go to her in bed and just strokes her with the gun. And she's just quite uncomfortable. Yeah. And I mean, you you, you saw that straight at the beginning as well. Like when she's drying him off, when he walks out of the sea, she she looks kind of disappointed and sad for most of that scene. So. Definitely. I mean, it's it's a nice way of painting Scaramanga. I think, like, he's a little bit of a creep at the same time. But yeah. Oh, yeah. It's Christopher Lee, so 
Well, I guess we'll get into it later. It's a charming oh, creep. Charming creep. <laughs> I'm invested in this creep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so then there's the junk, or this ship starts moving, uh, and then we see Bond on the little small boat, arms crossed at this point, kind of a little bit impatient, uh, but the small boat that he's on with the undercover police uh, officer goes up to the wrecked ship of the Queen Elizabeth again. Which I have to say, when you first see it, it's a really... This might be a word I'd say too much. I'm noticing with this podcast, there's a lot of words I default to. <laughs> yeah, same. Don't worry. When reviewing like 25 films, guess what? You start using the same same things again. Um, but very striking. Like this ship is huge in the dock. And the fact that it's not any sort of effect is really awesome. I love seeing this thing. Um, so again, we see it, but this time at night and Bond sees the ship and they start going up towards it and Bond sees his opportunity to escape. So he picks up the lifesaver and throws it at the man. Although he throws it off the man and he's off screen. It's shot very <laughs> awkwardly where it's just Bond picking up a lifesaver and throwing it like behind the camera and you don't see any of it, but he is supposed to have just like put it around somebody and trapped him so he can then jump off. No time to shoot that. There's no time. There's no. no. There's no time. But yeah, he, he throws the lifesaver on someone and jumps off and walks into the, or oh, he's on top of this ship. And then this microphone or this Tannoy speaker voice says, ah, welcome, Commander Bond. And <laughs> a hatch opens up. And he's like, oh, go down the hatch, please. Very good. Yeah, I like that. Bit. It's just, yeah, it's just so polite. I really like it when they call him Commander Bond because like the only people that do that are people in the Navy in general. Mm. So for Bond fans, you know, as soon as Commander Bond is said, you know, like, oh, this is going to be part of the, the Navy. Um, There'll be a sub They're kind of the only ones who up. calls him that because he yeah. was a commander in the Navy. Yeah. Yeah. It's like right, 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 right through here, sir. And it's just like, yeah, it's just <laughs> so ridiculous, but it's fun. Ah, oh, it's great. So then we get a very similar scene to the submarine scene from you only live twice is that right uh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it has to be has, yeah because it is um of which a british navy officer welcomes bond and walks him through this secret base so it turns out mi6 has set up this entire secret base of or base of operations here uh the reason being is because it's near hong kong and china and things like that so it's a very good place to to spy and be located while nobody suspects they're there. And the f cool thing about this place is that it's all tilted. They didn't completely redo the interior to be like a more traditional base. They simply built into what's there. So as Bond is being shown all these rooms, they're all tilted because this is a, a shipwreck and they just built around it. It's a, it's a really cool set or a really cool um, area that they have here. Yeah, I remember in a previous podcast, I think I might have called out this this scene for being too silly. And for the record, I would take that back, <laughs> like having watched this. I mean, it is silly, right? It is, it's like Alice in Wonderland sort of stuff or, or um, yeah, or Willy Wonka, right? All these slanted uh, hallways and steps going all funny directions and stuff. But I I forgot about that element they say where yeah it's like a, a good place to to keep track uh, like location wise and it can't be bugged they say so that's the bit that I'm like okay all right I'll, I'll I'll give them that like that does make sense I thought at first they just chose this because they wanted to have a funny looking base but in in the context of the film it's fine oh yeah yeah I think so and I I think the fact that I just really like the way the boat looks and the fact that it's a real shipwreck. Like, if they created it, maybe that would have been a bit much, but the idea of a real shipwreck could be somewhere that MI6 set up. It's just cool. It's that more cool integration um, that they sometimes have with the real world. Yeah. So then we get to the office at the back, and there's M. Like, M sitting there with Q next to him as well. And they reveal that the, the undercover policeman isn't an undercover policeman. He's a man called lieutenant oh that is that the american way did i just mess up uh i think i think they say it both ways in this film i think they i say think lieutenant so as well. and lieutenant yeah yeah le so lieutenant hip which is another name i missed as well i just called him lieutenant for the whole thing in my <laughs> <Right>. notes 
Like yeah. it's a, such a simple name. I don't know how I missed it, but yeah, it's <laughs> it's, uh, it's Lieutenant Hip. Yep. And yeah, here's his yeah. So Bond explains what happened, saying Scaramanga couldn't have had a contract on me because he had the perfect chance to kill him, but that didn't happen. And it's then revealed to Bond that the person that was killed was a man called Gibson, who was the man he was originally investigating about the energy crisis, about solar energy. And yeah, yeah. You get a funny line from M saying, oh, I almost wish Scaramanga did have a contract on you, Bond. This whole scene is very, um, very thick with detail. You really have to pay attention to this bit. <laughs> At least I did. I had to go back and listen to it again. Oh, I actually didn't think it was too bad. I, really? Maybe I'm just numb to it now, but I actually did somewhat follow it. I think the fact that I remembered the Gibson and the solar energy stuff from the start helped. Like, if I had forgotten that, then it probably would be a very different one because they do assume you 100% remember it because they just get straight into it. Like, you're mm -hmm. supposed to just know who Gibson is as soon as they say the name. Oh, yeah. So... What they're saying is that Gibson had developed a technology with solar energy, which generated energy at 95% efficiency, uh, called the Solex, a uh, Solex kind of panel thing. Um, so I don't really know what 95% efficiency really means. So, <laughs> like, it's but, just the MacGuffin. It's the MacGuffin of the film, right? It's yeah, it's so MacGuffin-y, this one where they do give some kind of explanation behind it but it's like you know okay whatever like yeah it's the thingy majog thingy majig where they there's an energy crisis and this will solve the energy crisis and i'm i am assuming that there was actually an energy crisis around this time as i think backdrop. so yeah like they normally do that don't they yeah and then i put like m was saying that we're almost out of gold but i don't know what that means oh really i see i missed that all right <laughs> I, I I don't yeah I, maybe I didn't get everything in the scene as I claimed to maybe I didn't actually <laughs> follow it because I just put Eb says we're almost out of gold they asked the lieutenant for it and I have no idea what that means absolutely no idea um, Sorry, I think yeah. they're saying that so Gibson had the sole legs on him when Hip was hanging out with him and investigating him and Hip says that he saw the Solex in the Bottoms Up Club, but when he went to retrieve it after the guy had been shot, it wasn't there, which you then put it together that Nick Knack had stolen the Solex from Gibson when he was uh, looking at the body earlier. Yeah. Of which we then get M sarcastically saying, well, great job, everyone. <laughs> well <done. laughs> bravo. Yeah, bravo. Good, <laughs> good jobs all round. Wow, you, somebody's dead. You lost the Solex. Great job, everyone. It's quite rightly annoyed, to be honest. I mean, they had it and then they lost it. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's not wrong. It's just funny the way he reacts to it. It's just like, yeah, good one, guys. Best in the biz. Yes. <laughs> so a man then called High Fat, which I don't... I, are all the Asian names in this film meant to be somewhat of a bit of a joke? Uh, Why is that one a joke? Am I missing something? High fat, like high fat food or something. That's what I took it as. Oh, I mean, maybe if he was like a really fat character, I'd be like, yeah, that's a bit. Come on oh, now. yeah, he is but, easy. But yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't get that. Oh, yeah, maybe I'm wrong then. Like, I, I, I know high is a thing, but the fact that his last name is just fat, I'm not saying that isn't a thing, but it seems like it felt too coincidental that the term high fat, like there's just a character called high fat, like high fat yogurt or something. That's all I was thinking of, but. Maybe I'm adding something into that that's not there. Mm, I don't know. Could be. I wouldn't put it past the film. Exactly, right? Like, that's the era we're in. We have a character called Goodnight, for goodness sake. <laughs> like, yeah. They are all about the silly names in this one. So I kind of assume that how fat. Like, there's a character called Chumi in yeah. this film. Yeah, Ch Chumi's pretty bad. Like, Chumi. And apparently... Hi okay, but... Yeah, so... Bond basically says there's this guy, I can't remember exactly what he does, but like a powerful businessman in the area is, and Bond kind of puts together that high fat probably hired Scaramanga to do this. Of which Bond then has a, a cunning idea and writes something on a piece of paper, gives it to Q, 
Q reads it and it's just like, oh, really, 007? <laughs> Maybe the best really we've had and probably will ever have. Oh. Did, do you actually see him write something? Because I, I always picture him just drawing a nipple. <laughs> oh, he probably that. did, yeah. <laughs> and with a big arrow. I think this, yeah. <laughs> it's just like a little kid's drawing. That I really want to see that, like Bond trying to draw something that just looks terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it says 007 in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, age 30-something, yeah. Because yeah. um, the, the, the whole thing in that, exp- that, as I was saying, like all that plot detail there, the bit that I had to go back and re-listen to was... So this Gibson person had basically fleed and they and they were trying to get him back so he had some sort of bargain for immunity or something that's the bit that I I got I stumbled over I mean it doesn't really matter cuz the character's dead and you're right like they they soon explain the links to high fat and that's where the the foot story goes but yeah that whole the whole plea I don't know if there's like a yeah some sort of bargaining chip is a thing that I kind of struggled with well, now that we're talking about it, I felt confident at the end of the scene. But you're, yeah, now that we're talking about it, I I missed a ton of stuff because I think I sort of remember that. But I'm just so used to the Bond jargon that you're just like, right, forget that. I'm not even going to try to understand what they're talking about with the bargaining chip and stuff. Because obviously, MI6 were doing some sort of sting there because they had a they had um hip working with the guy. So obviously, something was going down there. And if he if Gibson showed him the Solex. I'm assuming that was like, hey, help me out here. Here's the proof I have it. And the next step would have been them to to leave. Right. I, just, I remembered now because I think it, they say that the next place Gibson wanted to meet was in Bangkok because of his links to high fat, which is then why it goes there. It, it all makes perfect sense. That's the thing is, like, as you say, when you watch these films, you don't think about this stuff. But when we're doing a podcast and we have to explain where we are in the film and you have to say this, you suddenly sort of realise, oh, God, what, what actually happened there? <laughs> like it starts to unravel. Yeah, we don't want to think about it too much, but we have to. Exactly. But yes, yeah, so Bond has given Q a piece of paper, which he's uh, flummoxed by. And then M. So Bond is going to go and find High Fat, basically, and go after him in... So you say Bangkok, right, in Thailand? Yeah, he's gonna go. He's gonna go try and meet High Fat specifically because he thinks that High Fat would never have seen Scaramanga, so he's gonna disguise as Scaramanga. Yes, which is quite well, quite a uh, you know that, that's that's going all in there. It's quite a quite a leap of faith. I mean, it's a very cocky Bond idea, isn't it? Cocky like, Bond, Bond is back. Yeah, yeah. So this all ends with M saying, "Take good night with you." So we know that good night is going to be accompanying Bond on this mission to Bangkok. Mm. <laughs> Great. Oh boy. So we then cut to Bond in Bangkok at High Fat's grounds. I think at one point Hip says like, oh yeah, there's, there's loads of guards and everything, so it's going to be dangerous. Um, so you see Bond scouting the location, standing on Hip's shoulders. Oh no, sorry, vice versa. Hip's on Bond's shoulders, smoking a cigar and then um, they switch places and, and uh, Hip gives Bond a leg up, look over the wall, and Bond just, just goes in. He's just um, wasting no time, just struts in um, and starts to have a little poke around High Fat's uh, home. I think it's his home. Um, and that's where we come across the uh, the character of Chu Mi, who's not in the film for very long, but uh, she's just this this lady swimming naked in a pool. There's really not much apart from there for the butt of a joke, to be honest with you. That's probably for the best with a character called Chumi. I think that if she'd have been in the film anymore, who knows where they would have gone <laughs> with, with yeah, that. I as need a... to see Bond and Chumi and Goodnight. <laughs> the whole gang's here. <laughs> oh, yeah. So um, Bond's there at, next to this pool with Chumi and he starts to... The whole reason for this is because he obviously wants to... He wants to undress. He wants to show off his his fake third nipple that that Q has whipped up for him. Uh, so yeah, he starts to undress as if he's about to go swim in the pool. Uh, when High Fat comes over with his guards and, and starts to yell uh, about you know get off my grounds, blah blah blah. And then he sees the third nipple. Oh my goodness, it's Scaramanga. So he very quickly you know, tells the guards put put their guns away and ushers Bond over and. Um, it says himself like, oh, you know, it's a, this is a surprise. I wasn't expecting to meet you like this sort of thing. Uh, and this is a great little scene because it's it's Bond. We've said, said before we like how Bond um, disguises and actually does a bit of 
of spy work that's not just shooting or whatever and like, he's actually putting in the effort and so here he's he's trying to act as Scaramanga uh talking to Haifat and trying to work out a bit about what's going on um and it's it's really nice because you get Bond as Scaramanga talking about Bond which we saw elements of that with Diamonds Are Forever where he pretends to have killed Bond um in Amsterdam but yeah here you get the same thing about like he's really bigging himself up and you can just tell that he's really enjoying making out that like oh yeah there's this there's this James Bond agent and he might he might be meddling in this so that could be quite dangerous you maybe uh you should think about taking a hit out on him sort of thing and yeah I, I just like that element of it um but yeah the scene ends with with basically high fat saying yeah we'll think about it let's go for dinner which is a little bit of a anticlimax, but I suppose with the scene set up in that Bond just has a third nipple, where is it going to go? Like, yeah. what's the end goal with that scene? I just, I would just wish it wasn't a third nipple. It's just so stupid. <laughs> like, just to stop, you know, you know, just to get straight to the point, the fact that there's a core plot element in this film that comes up multiple times the fact that the main guy has a third nipple and you have to zoom in both on Scaramanga's one and it happens again in this scene mm. because they have to show high fat seeing the nipple so they zoom in on Roger Moore's chest with a fake nipple on it and it's just gross I just don't want to see it and to be honest I didn't really I kind of thought nothing of the scene to be honest like I could kind of you're right it is cool to see bond undercover talking about kind of himself basically but this thing kind of didn't really do anything for me this i put this on the pile of i'll just kind of forget about whatever scenes that we get in this and and the last film and i just wish it wasn't a nipple <laughs> just to go back to it like this needed to be something else i don't think it comes up again after this mm. i think this is our last nipple talk I think so. But then my question to you is, okay, if it's not a nipple, what would you have preferred? I don't care. Like, <laughs> <laughs> just don't do it like this. I guess they needed something so Bond could disguise himself as Scaramanga and have it be distinct enough so they know, ah, you're Scaramanga. But even so, it's not not like this. I don't think this is... I'm sure there's other ways of doing it. A missing finger. Or an extra finger. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Now we're talking. Yeah, they just don't zoom in on it at least twice. You know, if you're going to do it, <laughs> I, I can see it from a distance. I get it. Oh, I didn't mind the nipple. I'm just going to be honest. You didn't mind the nipple? I didn't mind the nipple. How many nipples out of three would you give? <laughs> I'd give it three. Give it three nipples. <laughs> three out of three. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that Roger Moore's nipple... Well, the Roger Moore's fake nipple didn't really quite match his actual nipples. They could have, they could have at least matched like color wise. But anyway, oh. that's going into way too much detail. Yeah, that's not what we're about. <laughs> sorry, about. sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, this all wraps up with Bond leaving after making the date, with some dinner plans, and at the end he says he must have found me quite titillating. So, I like that line. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a good line. I just wish it wasn't. <laughs> No, no one uses the word titillating. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's such a stretch, but that's why I like it. Yeah. And we get the reveal that Scaramanga was actually there and watching Bond do all this. Yeah. And High Fat meets up with him. And yeah, it turns out Scaramanga and High Fat did meet, which I think is weird because it goes back to the, what I was talking about before, about this element of this film about Scaramanga being hidden just kind of doesn't really work. And this is kind of part of it. Like, yeah, Scaramanga and High Fat just do know each other and do see each other. He, he, there's no effort to have he be hidden. High Fat just knows what he looks like. Mm. Yeah. I don't get it. I don't get the point of all this. No. I did actually, I mean, while I was watching this, I did forget that Scaramanga was there in real, like he was actually there. So that was a bit like, oh, right, yeah, that didn't, that whole... That whole disguise and, and what I just said that didn't actually work, which is quite funny. Oh, yeah, but they just completely set it up to be a trap. Not very good trap, we find out. But it's totally just like, yeah, we know it's Bond. We don't care. And and this goes back to what I was saying about how like this whole film, Scaramanga is actually kind of just in control of a lot of this stuff. And Bond mm. is just kind of lost, just trying his best. But Scaramanga is just one step ahead of him, like the entire step of the way. Yeah. Which is a pretty good way to set up a a Bond 
villain, I suppose, um, by having him just kind of be ahead like this and seem quite intelligent. They don't really focus on his intelligence, but obviously he's quite smart and very capable and, and things like that. There's some nice things that happen in the film. With yeah. Him. So this then cuts to later at night where Bond's in the white tux. Hey. It's the white tux, a black bow tie, black trousers. No red flower, though. No. And I think this is what I think of when I think of the white tux, which feels a bit odd now that I say it out loud, that the man with the golden gun. But I do think Roger wears it better than Sean. Yeah, I, I would have to agree. I think he does look very good here. Hmm. Do we see it again? Do you know? Um, I don't know if we see it again. Oh, oh do you mean just in, in Roger Moore's films? Yeah, yeah, just in Roger Moore's oh. films. Oh, oh, I'm sure we. I'm sure at least one more time. I hope, I hope so. so. Anyway, yeah. So then Bond is leaving his hotel, and Goodnight is there, and there's a bit of. I didn't write down any of this dialogue because the dialogue is so kind of clumsy between goodnight and bond it goes back to what i was saying where they don't really know what their relationship is or there's like an established relationship kind of but you don't get a good sense of it and they just go back between flirting and then just kind of being annoyed Mm -hmm. but i do kind of like the idea of this character in some respects of this kind of bond girl who's just kind of a bit useless but there's a bit more self-awareness about it that she's trying to get with Bond and just always kind of misses out and just kind of messes up. I feel like there was a lack of self-awareness with some of this stuff with the other Bond girls we got, like in the last film. I think Goodnight, they did a little bit of a better job. It's just so confused in terms of the tone and nature of their relationship and the fact that she is actually supposed to be the main Bond girl, which is where I think her character kind of falls down, ultimately. Yeah, I I think you're spot on. It's like you're, it's just it's just bad writing at the end of the day. Like the thing with this character is that she's meant to be this. She's meant to be another operative, right? Or she, she's at least she's at least there as as intel, and she's just terrible. And it's like, well, you could say we've had that before in some some situations where it's not it's not very believable that they're in the situation they they're in. Like with the last film, you, you're you're led to think that Rosie was actually from the CIA. Um, even though she ends up working for Kananga, but like she was terrible as well. <laughs> like you have all these these uh, supposed agents or whatever, and they're just all crap. Well, when I think of Goodnight, I kind of push that to the side. To be honest, I don't think of her as a as an agent. I mean, she is, but I don't really kind of judge her on those merits because she's so obviously not very good but at the same time like rosie was awful because she did the whole i'm so bad at this humph and then james having to help her out and it's just like oh god i hate that stuff uh where good night kind of doesn't do that she's just a bit useless and just kind of laughs it's like ha, yeah whoops <laughs> um, <laughs> tries her best and just kind of messes up and i find her a bit more likable because of that because she is trying and kind of a bit more good-natured about it where rosie was yeah more like a pounty teenager and stuff like that so I would put Goodnight above Rosie in terms of Bond girls. And I like her a bit more than Tiffany Case as well. But Tiffany kind of, they had her be one thing and then turned her into something else. And I didn't really like either versions of them. So Goodnight is just kind of consistently not great, but at least somewhat self-aware of it. I just, yeah. The thing that is when M says, oh, you know, take take Goodnight with you. I was like, do you, you, if you knew what Goodnight was like, you wouldn't be saying that, M. Come on. Mm, yeah, sending her with Bond seems like a interesting choice. Yeah. So, again, I, I like this scene where Bond is basically kind of saying, you know, the dialogue clumsy, but the actual joke of, oh, we'll go get dinner later tonight or something like that. And she's all happy about, oh, dinner with James and stuff. And then Bond gets into the car driven by Hip. And then in the back is Hip's nieces, these quite young girls. And then they drive off and then Goodnight's all mad and gets all huffy about it because Bond gets in a car with some teenage girls, which has some creepy connotations there, sure. Yeah. Um, I, think the, I, I, I like the idea of that, kind of. I didn't quite get the what her... Because he says something about, you know, keep the drinks cold and the food warm or something. Oh, I don't know. No I, 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 there was like a, there was. She says something when, like, at the end of the scene, and I don't know whether that was meant to be 
I don't know, just another example of me not liking her. <laughs> it's just anything she says, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I have a hard time fully justifying it. I just feel like the idea was there for some, like a quite a funny, enjoyable character that kind of plays on the tropes, and it's just more clumsy writing that jumps all over the place. Like with some rewrites and some retweaking, I think they could have had a really kind of funny, self-aware, point the finger at itself Bond girl, and they don't pull it off. But I, I think I kind of like the attempt. I would have. This is jumping ahead a little bit, but whilst we're just talking about Goodnight, I would have liked if she had a bit of redemption at the end of the film, but she just stays being, like, just basically causing problems. Uh, if she'd have done something at the end and be like, oh, wow, like, actually, she just saved the day, or <laughs> maybe not her saving the day, but she did something that made me feel like she was worth being there. But, yeah, there's just nothing. You mean if her butt saved the day rather than ruined it? If her bottom just wasn't as as big... And didn't press that button, <laughs> we would have been fine. I, w I wouldn't have hated her so much. Hmm. <laughs> but yeah, so Bond gets in the car with Hib, who has the nieces in there, which is a bit odd, uh, but it's for another joke. A lot of this film is setting up for jokes. Uh, but they're just in the back chatting and laughing, and Hip drops Bond off. Oh, the excuse is that he's like, oh, I got to give my nieces a lift. Don't worry about it. And then. Yeah, he just drops Bond off and then drives away. So Bond is there in, in his suit and things like that and says, yep, I'm Scaramanga, let me in at High uh, High Fat's place and starts walking through the garden that he was walking through before, but this time it's at night. And we see a load of kind of creepy... I put dolls down. Maybe they're mini statues? Yeah. Maybe it's better term. Yeah. Uh, all with masks on and kind of it's quite a gruesome scene where it's all these people not wearing much kind of stabbing each other um, while they've got all these masks on and we zoom in on one of them and it turns out one of them's real and it's knickknack oh my goodness <laughs> in like a loincloth and a mask holding a spear um, which leads to bond kind of going further in so he walks past them and we see two sumo wrestlers also kind of posed as statues but very like so obviously real <laughs> like yeah. i'd never bought that that was a sumo statue in front of bond no uh so they just they they pretend they're statues and then just start moving and then they just go over and just fight bond yeah. so i guess there is another kind of fight scene in this film or maybe more than i was thought i was thinking i do like how uh Bond just, he just tries to walk past him. <laughs> yeah, it's like, pleasant evening. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, very nice. And just carries him walking. It's that, it's that sort of tone that we mentioned in Live and Let Die where he just goes with it. You know, he's, he's not going to worry too much. And then, yeah, like they obviously stop him and they do start fighting. Um, and this is another one of those scenes that is just played for pure comedy, really, isn't it? How this, how this scene ends out, how he, how he ends up overcoming the sumo wrestlers. Or is, I guess, is it just one of them? It's two. But so he gives one of them, basically he gives one of them a wedgie. <laughs> Let's just cut to it. Like he gives yeah. one of them a wedgie using like the sumo thong or whatever that is. I don't know what you call them. What happens to the other one? I don't remember. He like knocks it, knocks him back. But this is another fight where there's just a lot of chopping going on. A lot of the yeah. old judo chops. So maybe he just judo chopped him, but I I don't know. Hmm. Okay. I mean, it's it's um. It's another it's another very big like close up shot of a bottom at least. <laughs> this film, that's two now this film's had. Oh, there's so so much butt stuff. <laughs> there really is. Wow. Oh, it's number one then. There we go. <laughs> let's cut to the end of the podcast. Yeah, let's save us all a little bit of time. But <laughs> but yeah, this fight's so whatever. Like it's another whatever scene. Like how much you enjoy this fight is more like how hilarious you think it is for Bond to grab a sumo guy's but and then give him a wedgie and the guy to be like oh it's like it's just not funny though <laughs> like it's these not bond really. films can be funny but when they do these exaggerated kind of bits like this it just it never works for me this is a bit too far even for me i'm gonna say even for joe even for me yeah wow no you don't like good night you don't like wedgies what what happened <sighs> i don't know because i i do i, I think i thought i liked this film I don't know what happened. You, maybe you grew up, Joe. Oh, that's sad. 
Maybe you're going to like Spectre. Maybe that's what this is foreshadowing. I, do you know what? I would like that. I, I want. I, I want to. I want to like things more. So maybe I just need this as a change of heart. That's nice. Uh, maybe next week you'll like things more. I think that's pretty. Oh, I certainly hope so. Yeah. Uh, but this ends with. So the suit. Yeah, he takes care of the sumos, but then Nick Knack comes from behind and knocks him out. Hmm. And then Nick Knack's all like, come on, get him, pick him up. So the sumo wrestlers then kind of pick him up and put him down. And Nick Knack looks so stupid here. Like, this is more just kind of comedy, just having a midget in a little mask with like a spear, not wearing much. I, I think you're meant to laugh at it, but it's so stupid. Especially because it's, it's, a, it's, uh, it's a trident as well. It's like, yeah, it's such a... A strange visual, but yeah, yeah, and I guess that's the point. But yeah, Nick now goes to kill him, of which High Fat then shows up and says, "No, no, you're not killing anyone in my garden. You're not doing it on my property," and says, "Go take him to school," which we don't know what that means. But then we cut to the next scene where Bond is being tended by a load of young, lovely Asian women, mm-hmm. of yeah. which he confirms or says it's heaven definitely heaven yeah it's getting all pampered and like bathed and massaged or all sorts of stuff having a great old time so yeah in in this scene it's uh soon revealed that bond is in some sort of is it a dojo is that the right i would call it a dojo is karate i think it's supposed to be okay i'm not too sure i don't think they ever say right yeah some sort of martial arts school anyway um, and he's sort of at the end of it and and in front of him is this big uh, like kind of ground and all these students and people come out of the end and, and go to sit down. And yeah, it's clear that there's some sort of some sort of act going on or something's going to happen. And, and Bond is just left there with the women to to watch it all unfold. And you get um, you basically get a few different rounds of these students fighting There's this one master looking guy at the, at the end who who kind of uh, like gives him the the nod and everything um i'm trying to remember the order of it so i think at first it's like two guys with swords go up and start fighting yeah um which i was i was trying to keep an eye on this i think that is actual like i think that's real like i was trying to work out like is that actual is that like soft like fake swords but i i think it is real i don't know it felt real like it looked really impressive how quickly these two guys were fighting with these dual swords yeah completely pointless but it looked good yeah it's one it's one of these scenarios where they've clearly they're in this this country they're in this situation so they're they're just going to use people that know what to do i'm trying to think of past examples but they do it all the time especially it might have even been in you only live twice where they had like some sort of ninja stuff going on and they it was just people actually knowing how to do this stuff it's the same thing here, like and, and for the, on that level of stuff, it's impressive. Like yeah, like you say, like it's really quick, and they're doing all these jumps and dodging and stuff. Um, and then one of them eventually kills the other one, or stabs him. I'm pretty sure he dies from that. So they they take him out, and then there's another one with this. No, it's not Chula. Chula's the last one. There's another guy that comes up, um, or is invited to stand up, and this is where it's revealed that Bond is now the one who has to go up to uh, up to the plate and take part. And um, I actually, I was quite surprised by this because, yeah, you get Bond walking up and you, and you get um, the other person, the other student there ready, ready and waiting and given the situation, they have to bow to each other before they start the fight. And straight off the bat, Bond just kicks him <laughs> as they're bowing. <laughs> as they're bowing, when he's caught off guard, he just gives him a big old kick to the face, uh, which really reminded me of like Indiana Jones, right? You know, the scene with the Indiana Jones and the sword fighting, and then he just shoots him. I was like, oh man, they, they, they're, um, they must be like, like an Indiana Jones type of joke. But I was like, actually, wait, this would have been, this would have been way before Indiana Jones. So it's kind of that, that gag anyway. Um, oh, this was hilarious. That really made me laugh because you do think... Now, there is a problem with this scene where it's just so bloody long and drawn out, but that does kind of work to his advantage for this one because there's such like kind of like, oh, like 
how is Bond going to get out of this one? Does he just know karate? Is he going to start doing flips? But no, mm. he just, as soon as the guy starts bowing, Bond just, just kicks him right in the head and knocks him out. It's, yep. it's brilliant. I really liked it. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, great little, it's a great little scene. Uh, although it doesn't really last for long. Yeah, then there's another guy that comes out. It's this guy who's near the front, dressed all in black. I think his name's Chula. That, that name st- stands out to me. Uh, he's like the tough one. And so he's then invited to start fighting Bond and like how, you know, they're bowing again, but they're clearly, he's like clearly looking up at Bond, not wanting to make the same mistake. And they have a fight. I really can't say much about this fight. I actually don't remember it at all, really. I don't know if there's anything that stands out to you. Uh, not really. I mean, it's quite an even fight. And I don't think they're really doing proper karate. I want to say maybe Roger Moore was doing some of this stuff, but that can't be right. Like, I didn't notice the guy playing Bond being an actual kind of stunt actor at any point. Yeah, I didn't... That's actually something I noticed as well during this film. There were some parts that I just immediately would have assumed is not Roger Moore, like where this scene goes on to in in the boats. But it is. (laughs) So that's... We're not at that stage yet where, you know, Roger Moore's not quite old (laughs) where they they replace him for every single scene where he has to move somewhat fast not quite there yet no like yeah and i think it was just him which kind of does it's always nice when that happens and it does kind of add to this whole i don't know bond not being this master combat guy or at least roger moore's version just kind of more stumbling and kind of getting his way through it Uh, i do think that works and I think it works for this fight as well. But yeah, I, I just need to say this whole scene just goes on for so long. And yeah. it's this is so such a padded scene. And, you know, to reiterate again, just like Live and Let Die and just like this film, this film should have been edited down. And this is a fil- scene that should have been edited down. Like, it's really funny to have this big, long build up to this fight and then Bond just kick the guy in the head. But it's not worth like five minutes of my life seeing everyone one by one come out and sit down and then the master comes out and then the other guys come out and then Bond gets a cup of tea. And it's just like, why, are we, just why are we watching all this? Like, it's just not worth it. Like, this should have been half the length. Like, have it in there, sure, but it should have been half the length. Easy. It, yeah. It, so, it should have... this. The way he gets out of the dojo should have been after he kicks the first guy. Like, we didn't even need this last fight, really. Even though, yeah, just yeah. bow, and as soon as he bows, he jumps out the window. <laughs> like That would have been yeah. pretty funny in itself. I, I still want the kick. Bow, bow kick, run. Bow, kick, <laughs> run, <laughs> yeah. Bow, kick, run. But yeah, so he fights um, this the guy in black. Um, as you say, it's quite an even fight, although eventually Bond gets the upper hand and punches him or kicks him or something or other and takes that as an opportunity to jump out the window uh, of this school where it just so happens perfectly timed, hip, and his nieces pull up um, in the car. And as you say, that whole thing with the nieces was a, was a big setup for exactly this scene because all the students come out um, like getting ready to fight uh, Bond, Hip, and, and uh, so Bond, <laughs> Bond's like, out the way, girls, sort of thing. You know, I'll handle this. And then the gag is, that, oh, actually, their uncle or something was a martial artist and taught them, and so they end up being amazing and taking out all these guards and, oh, sorry, all these students and uh, same with Hip, taking out loads of people and Bond doesn't really have to do much. He's just standing there in the middle of it all. Um, it, is, it is silly and it's almost the fact that you, that you, you, know, you see the set, set up of it and it's so ham-fisted in there is kind of bad, but I still kind of like it. I do still kind of like it. Mm, yeah, I kind of like it as well. It's not making me laugh all that much and stuff, but for a film like this that is so clearly going more for the comedy. It's like an enjoyable little moment. I think the fact that you actually get to see this karate being pulled off helps. Like, it does seem like they actually do know karate and they are actually fighting people. It's not just these wee kind of fights. It is people actually, you get a bit of a a brawl between all these people. So there's Mm -hmm. at least some sort of payoff there, action-wise. Yeah, definitely fun, for sure. And I think at this point is where we get a remix of the main theme or we hear the man with the golden gun theme for the first time oh really for the first time oh i didn't notice it before this point but we definitely get it here oh okay i I didn't yeah you're probably right it might have been elsewhere but i think this is the first obvious time because yeah 
they knock everyone out, but there's still a group of people led by the guy in the in the black robe. So they they run off uh, and are, are being chased, and they play this remix of the theme. And <laughs> as they're all being chased, uh, Hip and the knees is getting in the car, and Bond just doesn't. And they just drive off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it just looks so defeated. You have, yeah, you have poor Roger running after the car. The niece is freaking out at Hip. I'm assuming they're saying go back for him. But Hip just buggers off. And then that's it. Bond's just completely left behind. Yeah, that's never really explained why Hip never comes back. Yeah, I don't but... think he's a double agent. Oh, now that would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it made me laugh, so I don't mind. The visual of the nieces in the back freaking out with Roger Moore just behind them, just <laughs> struggling. <laughs> wait, wait for Roger. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so they drive away. So basically, our Bond's on foot, and he has a load of karate masters or whatever. Everyone else is chasing him, so he just kind of runs away. And there's a river nearby, so he jumps into a boat, and they catch up with him. So to hold them off for a bit, he takes the the bit of the boat where the motor is, where the propeller, yeah, is the propeller, and takes that out of the water, turns it on, and then like shoes them back with it. So they're spinning this propeller, and then he's kind of going back with them, and and I don't know if I wrote this down right because he says something, and I'm pretty sure it's completely stupid. Where he's in the boat, and they're there trying to get him, but can't get to him. And he says, it looks like we have a Mexican screw-off, gentlemen. Yeah, that, I, I did not get that at all. It is screw-off, he said, right? Yep, and I can confirm that, because I watched this with subtitles on. Oh, good, I just, okay. I, I didn't get it. But yeah, I don't get it. Like, I, obviously, Mex- Mexican show-off, and it's a pun of that, but where does the screw come into it? Well, I, yeah, like, it's, do you know what? I don't even, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> he doesn't care? <laughs> I just don't care. That's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> number one in my rankings. <laughs> number one. I didn't care. So it goes number one. Um, um, but yeah, so basically, eventually he just puts the propeller back in the water and the boat goes. So he's off on the boat and everyone's running along the side of the river trying to get him. But quite shortly afterwards, the boat breaks so Bond is there trying to fix his boat. And we see a kid on a nearby boat on like a boat full of tourists. And he has this little elephant statue. And he just keeps saying like, Mr. Elephant, 80 bucks. 80 bucks, you buy elephant. And everyone's just ignoring him. So he jumps off that boat into the water. And then swims up to Bond's boat as he's trying to fix it. And just does the same thing to him like, Mr. Elephant, 60 bucks. And then he's like, ah, you're good looking. Just for you, I'll bring it down. 20 bucks, just for you. Of which Bond says, I'll give you 20,000 bucks if you can make the boat go faster. Of which the kid then just moves like one little hatch. Yeah, it just like releases some fuel or something. Yeah, just a very easy little thing. And it starts working. He gives a big grin. And it's like, yay, I'm going to get 20 bucks. And Bond just pushes him in the river. <laughs> and uh, drives this, away. this is why the film is number one. <laughs> Yeah, so good. Like a proper like face face push into the back into the water. Love it. Yeah, just no consideration. Just like, oh, I'm done. Out, off you go. <laughs> it's and just, just shouting in the water. Oh, my twenty bucks, twenty thousand bucks. You owe me if money. If there's one thing I like to see in films, it's annoying children get get bullied. So <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Thank you, Roger. Hmm. I mean, we've seen similar comedy to this of Bond just being quite bullish i guess quite quite brutal to the point for comedic yeah. effect yeah but this is another one that works so bond is able to ride off on his boat and he is going very quickly and he splashes a nearby boat full of tourists um and it pans over and look who it is it's none other than the beloved bond <laughs> character <laughs> Of J W, oh. <laughs> well, it's got J W in it. No, uh, J W Pepper, Sheriff J W Pepper, who we saw in the previous film in the Louisiana Bayous, but he's back and he's on the holiday with his wife. Just so <laughs> happens to be in the same place at the same time as Bond in Bangkok. How's about that? Uh, okay, so 
let's just quickly have you know let's just go over what happens in the scene um bond this whole scene right which is meant to be one of the kind of main action scenes of the film because there aren't many as i've said before um it's not very interesting it's, it's really just bond driving around on this boat um pulls a few tricks like hiding and stuff like that well that's how it ends in that you know trying to trying to out out chase these bad guys um but he ends up he ends up just uh what is he he, he like hides and then they're there and then he like smashes through the boat yeah so he's on a motorboat so then he gets yeah so when it's on they can just know where he is so he turns it off and then yeah drives in the middle of it because it's a wooden boat and that causes them to sink yeah so that's how he got rid of them back to jw pepper uh all whilst this is happening yeah he's on the boat he's with his wife and then at some point they get off the boat and the wife wants to buy one of the little elephants and god and then there's just this whole scene with jw pepper and then an actual elephant next to him finally uh, yeah finally it's what the audiences have been asking for um i'm glad sean connery's still getting work <laughs> <laughs> oh um, but yeah like this elephant is 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 like putting his trunk in his pocket and everything and so what makes this scene so awful and i didn't i, was, I think i might say i didn't mind jw pepper in live and let die like it was the scene that he was in with the, the speedboat chase was long, but I think he was okay, really. I never really got why people disliked him so much. Now I get it, because he is just terrible in this film. And the main reason for that is because, well, at least from my opinion, the main reason for that is because, okay, in the first, in Live and Let Die, he was annoying, but he was annoying, A, in America, or like B, in his own environment. Here he just looks like a terrible human being, because he's in you know as a tourist in this other country and he's just constantly constantly yelling at everyone and and calling him and i had to make i had to google this right because I, I wanted to make sure that we weren't going to say something inappropriate on this podcast so just a fair warning like i did i did my research it's not a slur at least i don't think it is but he calls everyone pointy heads and i was I like oh it god was. Is- i thought he was referencing you know those specific type of hats that get associated with like Chinese stereotypes. I thought that's what that was. Well, the oh, see that would make sense. That's why as I was watching, I was like, "Oh God, this is so bad. This is terrible. Please get him off screen." It's just because he says it numerous times in the film. Um, but then I googled it, and the only thing that comes up on Google is about this film. So I oh, don't right. know. Yeah, I was quite surprised by that. But either way, it's not. It's not nice. It's not a pleasant thing. And he just looks like such a jerk. I, I so yeah. That's kind of he does come back in the film, but I totally get why people dislike this character because here he's just unbearable. Well, it's interesting because, like you say, yeah, live and let die. He's the sheriff, a Louisiana sheriff, and they just kind of play him up for laughs. But the context of this film is that they brought him back just to kind of like he they took him out of that context. Yeah. And I guess for he was such a great comedy character that he worked in any situation. You know what they say about comedy characters, like, you know, you if you write a good enough character, like Mr. Bean, right? You could put him in any location and comedy will kind of naturally happen just due to due to that character. Mm-hmm. And he's treated the same way. Like, he's back, everybody. It's JW Pepper on the Your boat. Round of applause, everyone. <laughs> yeah, like he's treated like he's this great character. And I guess the idea is that you're supposed to be excited to see him and laugh at his antics. And it so falls flat. Like, who on the star thought, yes, this guy is hilarious? Like, maybe if they brought him back for like one quick gag. Like, I think just splashing him with water and being annoyed. And if that was the only bit we saw, that would have been quite funny. (laughs) Yes, I totally agree. But we get this scene and we get another scene with him as well. And yeah, it's just kind of way too much. It didn't really bother me too much. I like I would definitely prefer it wasn't in there. But I'm kind of in the same mind about this and Live and Let Die where it's like... It, at one point, if you asked me a few years ago, I probably would have been ranting and going crazy about this. Because overall it is terrible. But I have kind of just like... <laughs> I'm going to put a Joe and say, just don't care that much. <laughs> <laughs> That's my catchphrase. 
Yeah, I just don't <laughs> care anymore. Uh, uh, but it's, yeah, so it doesn't bother me too much. But yeah, when you think about it, it's terrible. And the way they treat this character with such kind of regard as a comedy character is absolutely insane. I don't mm. care if it was the 70s. Like, was there, a, was it a gas leak or something? Like, this can't <laughs> have been accepted and thought this no this is hilarious and great i think what makes it worse for me is is as i say like in live and let die i didn't find him that bad so i was like oh phew you know that was okay actually and then when i thought of this film before watching it i thought uh, you know i remember the stunt the car stunt that we're going to get to eventually and I thought, oh that was cool and i know that jw's in that scene and that's i didn't mind him there i forgot that there's this bit and that's why i was like oh damn okay he does suck so that's that's oh I'm a little bit more disappointed than than maybe you but anyway let's move on let's move you on you had high JW. hopes for J. I did I thought I thought it might be a bit more a bit redeemable but he's really not hmm. so eventually he calls an elephant ugly and the elephant pushes him into the river <laughs> he uh, falls in the water that's good fine. stuff yeah uh, so. Bond gets away, basically. He's on his boat and drives away. The, like, the actual scene is very short, which is nice. When you say boat chase and J.W. Pepper, I'm getting flashbacks, but this was very quick. Like, most of this scene is actually just J.W. Pepper and his wife buying elephants and hanging out with an elephant. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then we cut to Scaramanga uh, at High Fat's, uh, well, where we saw before, and basically in High Fat's office where Scaramanga basically mocks the martial arts score, saying, yeah, great job, High Fat. Yeah, they really got him. Um, because they know that Bond got away, and they failed. So High Fat is... Or High Fat, sorry. Is explaining that, yeah, I'm done. I'm going to go into hiding. I'm just trying to save my own skin here. I don't want any part of this. If you've got any sense, you'll go into hiding too. And then... Hold on, which way around? Who has the Solex first here? Uh, High Fat does. He gets out of his safe. Yeah. So yeah, High Fat is emptying his safe. Gets the Solex, and High Fat is basically saying to Scaramanga, "Like you work for me, I I pay you. You're I'm the boss here." And Scaramanga is like, "Yep, sounds good. Mm-hmm, yep." Uh, <laughs> but we see that Scaramanga had like a lighter before, and he's turning this lighter and disassembling it, and then reassembling it into the golden gun. Um, oh that's what the golden gun is I d- oh. <laughs> that's the guy that's the man that's the man and that's, that's the, the golden man. gun right that's what lulu was singing about let's bring her back come on lulu <laughs> lulu one more time <laughs> <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> uh, okay go away now <laughs> yeah bye uh yeah so then scaramanga smiles and says ah this isn't it won't be a problem. I can't remember exactly what High Fat says, but responding to him. And then shoots High Fat and, and kills him. And then he, he calmly puts the gun away and someone comes in and says, oh, what happened? What happened here? And Scaramanga's like, oh, I guess I'm the new chairman of the board. I've taken over this company. So I wanted to know, how did you feel about the whole golden gun being able to assemble it out of like spare parts? Well, not spare parts, but like different objects. Well, that's the thing. That's that's one of the things that I think a lot of people remember about the Golden Gun is that yeah, it's a pen and it's a lighter and it's this and it's that. Having rewatched this, that's really not an element in this film, like at all. I, I, I you would have thought with that being the aspect to it, there would be a scene where Scaramanga has to sneak in or like I don't know, someone checks Scaramanga for a gun and they don't find it, so they let him in, and then that's how he makes it and does a shot or something. But that's that doesn't exist like this is the only time when you really see the gun being assembled like that and so it's like one of those things where i think people actually may be misremembering it a bit and they actually go back and and watch the film it's yeah there's really not much to it i think it's just a strong enough concept isn't it it's a cool concept but i wish it was actually part of the plot yeah i mean we do see it once again but this is the only time where we actually see that process and i do appreciate that like it's cool seeing the actual process of Scaramanga sitting there and actually pulling this together nice and slow and calmly as well. It's another calm villain sort of trope. Mm. Um, but it does make the gun look a bit weird, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It has a very distinctive look, but because it has to have been assembled from like a lighter and like a pen or something like that, yeah. it's a few different parts. It does mean it looks a bit weird. So I wouldn't say it kind of looks cool. It's definitely iconic, but it looks a bit 
odd because of all these parts? I think uh, at least more like these days, um, people might think of the Golden Gun more with Goldeneye. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like the, so. the one the one shot, one kill thing, which, you know, is in this film. Like it only takes one bullet is what he says. But yeah, I think a lot of people, when they think of Golden the Golden Gun, they think, oh, yeah, multiplayer on Goldeneye. <laughs> Yeah, so I like the Golden Gun. Um, yeah, I think Scaramanga as a character kind of sells it a bit more, right? Like maybe yeah. somebody else with the Golden Gun, it wouldn't work so much. But because it's Christopher Lee assembling this and having fun shooting it, it definitely elevates it a bit. Yeah, and you have a cool line at the end of the scene, just because Christopher Lee has such a good, strong voice where he, I think he says something like, you know, he always did like that mausoleum, put him in it, and he just walks off. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's just it's like the deep voice, the way he says it, it's so good. <laughs> yeah it's like menacing but it's not super menacing it's like yeah it's a really nice balance after that scene we cut back to uh bond at the hotel and he's about to have dinner with good night good night's back everyone all right neat <laughs> uh, so yeah they're sat outside and there's some champagne brought over uh foo yuck foo yuck which I think ends up actually being quite nice. So there you go. Bond Bond needs to uh, expand his horizons. He can't just rely on the Bollinger all the time. But I mean, uh, it ends up being nice. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So this no, whole no, thing. Right. I d- I, it doesn't, does it? Oh, I thought he. I thought he tries it, and and it it tastes all right. I thought he tried it and was like, hmm, I just didn't. Oh, because okay. he says it again when he goes to his hotel room. I I took it that he was just so disgusted by all this. Well, I mean, the, the, given the scene where he is trying to sleep with Goodnight, and maybe he, yeah, maybe he's just playing it off. Doesn't want to hurt her feelings. Because I don't think if he enjoyed it, because he says it in the hotel, like he gets back to the hotel room by himself and mutters like "foo yuck." I don't think he would say that if he enjoyed it. Foo yuck. Yeah, I suppose that makes sense. I mean, it's and it is called name. yuck as well. So I think the whole <laughs> point is him saying "foo yuck" is like, yeah, it's yuck. Yeah. Oh, I thought they subverted it a bit, but no, okay, I missed that then. Anyway, uh, you get this little scene between Bond and Goodnight, which uh, is just, it's just them two. It's basically Bond, you know, oh, we, you know, there's a bit of time to kill sort of thing and, and trying to put the moves on, on Goodnight. And as you said before, like there's this, there's this uh, history that's sort of set up between these characters. So you, you, you think this is going to go somewhere, but then Goodnight kind of palms him off eventually and just, you know, I can think of better ways to spend my night rather than being your passing fancy or something, she says. And so she walks off and Bond's, Bond looks legitimately annoyed, like, damn, <laughs> I was really hoping for that. Um, and goes back to his hotel room and you're right, that's when he's like, foo, yuck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's such a silly nothing joke, but I, Bond just being disgusted by... I mean, I took his Bond being disgusted. It did make I, me laugh. That does make he, a lot more sense. Yeah. When he goes in the hotel and he's still thinking about this terrible... <laughs> like, foo yuck, what? The, what? If you're Why not going to do Fogo Martini, shaking not stirred, just give him a drink he hates and let him, let him <laughs> not enjoy it. Uh, I think there's also a shot somewhere where you see Scaramanga's boat. I think it's not far away. Yeah, the junk. Uh, the junk, yeah. Uh, but then, yeah, it cuts back to Bond in the hotel room. And, hey, it turns out... This is another reason why I hate Mary Goodnight. Uh, hey, it turns out she's there, actually. Um, <laughs> she's in the room, and actually, she does want to sleep with Bond. And she says, like, oh, you know, did you like my attempt at trying to to say no or whatever? And, and it's just like, oh, what a pathetic character. <laughs> like, if you're going to try and do that, like, I don't understand what the point of that was. But, yeah, she's very quickly like, oh, James, sort of thing. And um, they start to canoodle when another lady comes in or at least someone starts to sh- uh, like twist the the handle of the hotel room door and um <laughs> i mean i should maybe i shouldn't be so annoyed at a uh, uh, good night because she does get like the short she does pull the short straw quite a lot doesn't she like so whilst this is happening bond sort of like shoves her under the covers and hides her uh and goes to see who's at the door and it's Anders, it's Anders, it's the lady that we've seen uh, blow, uh, Scaramanga's, I was say Blofeld then, uh, Scaramanga's <laughs> mistress, I guess. Um, she's there 
and you get a little bit of a little bit between her and Bond where it's revealed that actually it was her who sent the golden bullet with 007, you know, the initials on it uh, and an S because she wants out. Like she wants out of this situation she's in with Scaramanga as as Tom said, like basically his prisoner. Um, so she wanted, she faked this whole set, like set up to try and get Bond to kill Scaramanga. That's the only way that she could be kind of set free. Um, and by doing that, she sort of promises, because Bond mentions, okay, great, that's fine, but what about the Solex? Because, you know, that's that's what they're actually after at the end of the day. So um, he, she says, yeah, you know, I'll give you the Solex, all that sort of stuff. It's kind of... Um, there's some there's some dialogue in this scene where it's what she says, you know, uh, you can have me if you want sort of thing. And it's like, oh, yeah, oh, sort of. Yeah. But it's like, well, you're getting out of one situation to be in one like that. Like what's, what's going on? But um, the point is that, yeah, they she promises the Solex to Bond. Um, and so what they do is <laughs> they get straight onto it or she goes into the the bathroom to get ready. Um, to sleep together and so bond just like quickly gets mid uh good night out of bed and, and ushers her into the wardrobe and i don't just... get this bit because i got the feeling that she went to the door and bond was like no 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 you're going in the wardrobe like it looked like to me she was trying to leave the room and bond stopped her and shoved her in the wardrobe instead oh that's i don't because know because she could have just left yeah right? like I... she, she had time i don't this is like it's just weird so you if you actually think of what's going on here, Bond locks her in, or not locks her, but puts her in the wardrobe. And so she has to sit there and listen to them have sex. It's like, oh, that poor lady. Because especially how she's just she's just said, like, oh, I've always dreamed of this, Bond. I've, I've, I didn't think this would happen that we'd meet again and she's wanted this. And now she's having to, you know, listen to that. It's like, oh, that's not very nice. Um, but it is a strange choice. I don't know why she didn't just go out the, the door. Yeah. But I think she got, it's, I think it's to do with Bond. I think it's just Bond being bond mm. but i really don't like this scene i think it's quite bad because yeah it, it comes down to this woman angela whatever her name is i don't know like her character is just terrible and it's just it's the same thing about the first scene where they're just trying to do too many things with this character and it makes bond seem like an absolute creep and it just makes these uncomfortable where she's like i want you to like i think the idea is pretty cool the idea of scaramanga has someone under control or is as a prisoner basically and she sends a signal to Dane's bond to come and take him out because she says you're the only one that can kill him like that's pretty cool i like that setup but yeah, the yeah. fact that we then have to go to her saying like i've dreamed about you setting me free and stuff especially considering the last scene where he was like gonna break her arm and manipulating her and stuff like that it's just like you can't have it both ways you can't have them start that way and then come back and then she's just like falling into Bond's arms. It's just so creepy. And I just, this this might be the thing that bothers me the most about the film, honestly. And it might that might be more a personal thing. But this character and the storyline is just horrible. And I just hate the way it kind of plays out. And these scenes just make me so uncomfortable. Mm. At least the actress got another chance, uh, you know, because she's she's an octopusy as well, so she came back and had another go at least. Hmm. I mean, I will say she's not a bad actress. I wouldn't yeah. say she'd be particularly good, but I don't think she's also bad. It's just she's given the, a bad character. Yeah, it's a bad character, bad writing, and Roger Moore. It's just not not great for this. Like, this is just terrible. I really got nothing nice to say about it. Yeah, kind of a. I mean, it's. A, I wrote down in my notes like unnecessary scene. It is necessary in in terms of like you know they need to progress the plot with the Solex, but all this stuff about the wardrobe and and that was just like oh could they not have done that a different way? But anyway, um. So yeah, the uh, afterwards, Bond wakes up good night, and I think it had been like a couple of hours, uh, and kind of explains that yep we're we're on track to get the Solex. Uh, Solex. Um. Anders has has made a a date to to pass it over. And then we get the is it the, is there anything else before it goes on to the boxing match or is that it? yeah so basically yeah so good night fed asleep in there which is quite funny yeah. and this is a time where Bond says darling and I think the fact that he uses darling in this context of yeah I just completely screwed you over and shoved you in a wardrobe and had you sleep in there and then calls her darling is like it's rude but yes <laughs> it's, it's pretty bad um, but then we also get a brief scene of 
Scaramanga lying perfectly in bed, like oh, a yeah. robot, basically. Yep. And Angie, I, I don't know her name. Angie enters and goes to the safe that's nearby, which has the Solex in, and basically says, yep, I'm putting jewellery in there. And that's kind of that. So basically implying that... Well, there's a little bit of a hint that Scaramanga knows that something is up, but it's not confirmed. And then we basically see how she can steal the Solex because she has access to the safe and puts her jewelry jewelry in the same way, uh, the same safe that the Solex is is stored. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I totally forgot about that scene. But yeah, because like he says, like, oh, you know, you're back late. So that's that's the the cue for like some suspicion there. Hmm. So then, yeah, this cuts to uh, a boxing. Well, it's not really a boxing match, is it? It's martial arts. I'm not too sure exactly what MMA or something. Maybe. I think MMA is quite new, maybe. I don't know. Mm. Uh, but some sort of big match where there's a huge crowd, everyone's screaming and cheering and things like that, and two people fighting in the middle. And the idea that Bond is going to meet up with Angie. <laughs> no, that's not her name. Uh, Angie and give get the Solex, basically. So Bond is there, and we see Good Knight is nearby because, yeah, she's an agent, just to remind everyone. Um, <clears throat> she can't have been... She can't have had a good night's sleep. No, no. Maybe got a crick in the neck. Yeah. Maybe that's the explanation for some of her dumb decisions. She just needs a decent nice rest, <laughs> not in a wardrobe. Oh, yeah. Do you know what? That, that makes me feel a bit better, actually. Yeah. I mean, she is called Good Night, so maybe that's an ironic name. Mm. Well, we all know why she's called Good Night for one joke at the end of the film. But, <laughs> um, oh, yeah. But yeah, so she's on this sting watching, and we see that uh, Lieutenant Hip is there as well disguised as a peanut salesman so he's got a little hat which is very cute and he's got a little tray full of peanuts <laughs> and he's kind of walking around um so i just love that you're pointing out the hat that's <laughs> just a nice little hat it's a nice hat hey look good you look good there hip <laughs> nice one hip uh so bond then goes and meets up with with angie and sits down next to her and she seems a bit off i think even immediately before anything's confirmed something's not quite right and then Bond starts talking because, again, he doesn't, he's so oblivious to anything that goes on around him and says, like, have you bought the Solex? Until he looks at her closer and sees that there's a bullet hole in her chest. So she's not blinking. Her eyes are open, but she's sitting up straight, but she's dead, basically. Mm, that's uh, some very quick rigor mortis right there. I don't understand how she's still so upright, but there we are. Yeah, I'm a bit conflicted about it. I think it is quite a cool little visual to have this someone who's just kind of dead like this. But yeah, you're right. It it doesn't make any sense that she would be standing up right this. But the idea of Bond sitting next to someone and like she's just dead, that's pretty hardcore, I guess. Mm, Yeah. So Bond then kind of checks her handbag to see if she has the Solex and is like, "Oh, darling, you're so silly. Off, you forgot the tickets. Ha 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 ha!" Like just playing it off. And then Scaramanga just sits next to him. It's just right there. There's Christopher Lee. Right there. (laughs) Yeah. And Nick Knack then shows up behind him with a gun, eating some peanuts. (laughs) Because apparently I think he, like, hid the gun in peanuts or something. Bond makes a comment about it, about hiding a gun in peanuts and that being a new one. And he really likes peanuts. He does. He's going crazy on those peanuts. Yeah. Uh, so Scaramanga then basically introduces himself straight up being like, I'm Scaramanga and talks about, I feel I really know you and, and things like that. Then Scaramanga basically starts going off on his backstory where he says, my only real friend was an elephant back in the circus. Oh, yeah. And explains his backstory of one, the, the reason he's an assassin and likes killing people is because his only friend in the circle was an elephant who then I think got killed or tortured or something. So he then killed the person who did it. And he was like, well, that's my favorite thing now. So now he just loves murdering people. Yeah, I mean, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's the old elephant friend's backstory. It's such yeah. a cliche. I've seen it so many times. I yawned, actually. Yeah, you're like, oh. <laughs> Openly yawned. <laughs> um, but while this is happening, I think it turns out the Solex was actually in the bag. So Scaramanga knew this was all happening, but I think Scaramanga still let her steal it. Because as Bond emptied out the bag, the Solex fell onto the floor. Yeah. The very disgusting, disgusting floor. Peanut-covered floor. Yeah, like, yeah, like, oh, so gross. Whoever the set designer was really went all in to make this floor look as unpleasant as possible. 
<laughs> so Bond does the old classic, the old, I'm going to go and buy some peanuts and drop them so I can then go and pick up the Solex off the floor and then put the Solex on the peanut tray. Genius. Inspired. He does this a few times where he just accidentally dr- or accidentally drops something just so he can kind of bend over. Like he did it with the, the golden bullet at the start as well. Mm. Like he loves that trick. Hey, it works. Yeah. It's like, I mean, I think cats do it as well. I think cats love that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so he knocks it over and basically he puts the Solex on the tray without Scaramanga noticing. Oh, I don't think he does. And that person is Hip. Hip is the one who came along. And I actually really like how this is shot because this all happens very quickly. Like, you get enough information to know that, yes, the exchange has happened and Hip now has the Solex. But they kind of shoot it very quickly just to kind of give it a good sense of the fact that Scaramanga maybe didn't notice it. Um, yeah. Very nicely edited. Yeah, and it's nice just to see them actually do something successful. As, as M would have pointed out, like the, the mission has not gone very well so far. So it's nice to actually see, hey, something worked. I mean, not for, it doesn't last long, but something. Yeah, it, it actually went to plan. So the lieutenant then, or Hip, then leaves the place and meets up with Goodnight and says, here's the Solex, keep it safe. I gotta go back and support Bond. There's a midget with a gun on him. <laughs> he needs help. Uh, of which good I just laughs at that. Just finds that hilarious. Mm, yeah. Um, so Scaramanga then no- knows this is a bit odd. Basically knows what the woman stole from him, but walks off anyway. Yeah. This is why I'm a bit confused. I don't know if Scaramanga knows where the Solex is. But Scaramanga is shown in this film as kind of being in control and having all these plans and having them go quite well. But this time, I'm not too sure. But he's like, yeah, I know who stole with him and leaves and is like, yeah, don't don't follow me as well. Yeah, I, I, I'm the same. I don't quite know. I mean, where this leads to, you know, why Goodnight gets captured. But I don't think he knew that she had it. So, but that's the thing is, as we said, he, he's, he's a very kind of, cool calm and collected villain so far and that kind of just plays into this way he's not really revealing much he just walks off and and that's it i will say it was quite nice to have because this is the first time the two characters meet face to face right yep and it's quite nice that this actually just ends with them just just walking you know he just leaves like you really think oh no there's the villain right next to bond what's gonna happen he's got no he's got no qualms he's got no qualms with with bond like as you say like he's sort of kind of, uh, he's a fond of him, you know, he's fond of Bond as a, as a fellow assassin that he would see him as. So it's kind of a, a refreshing change of pace where like, yeah, the villain actually just walks off and doesn't doesn't really go anywhere. Hmm. It's definitely trying to harper back to the older Bond films, like that kind of back and forth we got with Dr. No, where there's just time where Bond and the villain just sit and talk, and Goldfinger as well, of course. So there's no real payoff to this scene. It's basically all about the Solex and it leads into a big chase scene, sure. But this scene is just Scaramanga thinking Bond's awesome and then Bond just trying to get this Solex and trying to get what he's here to get. But you get to hear him talk and Christopher Lee, again, he's just so great at just, even though he's describing this ridiculous backstory, he really sells it and he comes across as a little, you know, quite deranged here. Calm and in control, but also quite kind of deranged about how he loves killing people and, and things like that. And, you know, it's the fact that it's Christopher Lee. Once again, he sells it very well. And it's just nice that, yeah, it's a simple scene in terms of those two just kind of talking and trying to build it up, which is why I kind of said earlier in the podcast, I do feel like there is a decent amount of time with Scaramanga. It's just there's so much filler stuff that it does kind of make you kind of forget scenes like this because when they do do these scenes, that is pretty good. Yeah, that yeah, you're right. Yeah. So yeah, as we mentioned, Hip has given Goodnight the Solex and I'm warned about there's a midget with a gun. Um, so where Scaramanga and Nicknack eventually do leave, uh, uh, Goodnight spots this and um, decides now is the best time to plant her homing tracker, which she did mention before. I think like something to do with one, the dress she was wearing. And it's like, oh yeah, there's a tracker as one of the buttons um, or a homer, as she calls it. And so, yeah, she decides this is the best time to, to 
to actually track these supposed bad guys that just had a gun on Bond. So as they're, um, or as Knickknack's getting in the car, she sneaks behind and tries to put it in the trunk. And then Scaramanga just comes along and just chucks her in. <laughs> I love mm. how quickly he does it. It's just like one move and she's in and slams the trunk, um, the boot shut. Uh, obviously, while she still has the Solex. But she has got a walkie-talkie, so she is still able to communicate with Bond and Hip, who eventually work out what's happened and trying to find a way to chase after her, because I think she knows the car or the, uh, the, the license plate or something she remembers. Well, yeah, um, she describes the car, and then as she's describing the car, it drives past Bond and Hip at the exact same moment, so they, they know who to chase. Right, and they're about to drive off, but then realize they don't have the keys because Goodnight has the keys. Wow, uh, wow. Wow, wow, yeah. Uh, so it's just a little bit, you know, do you have the keys, Goodnight? Yeah, they're right here. So, oh. uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so instead, Bond just like runs around aimlessly for a bit and, you know, trying to keep eye, an eye on the car as it's driving off. And eventually just, you know, spots this car uh, sales room behind him. And decides to steal a car from there. And so you cut to uh, JW's back. Hey. Again. Back again for round two. Yes, it just so happens that JW Pepper is in this car wanting a little demonstration. So as Bond jumps in, uh, and yeah, Pepper's like, hey, you want to give this a drive? And he's like, sure, sure thing, sir. And so they smash out the front of this uh, sales room and they chase after Scaramanga. And. Um, We've made so many similarities to how that you know this is like live and let die, and I think this is one of the most similar scenes because it's it reminded me a lot of well the the, the speedboat chase from live and let die where we have a lot of this beginning uh, action scene with the car chase, uh, but it's just in it's just no music. Um, it's not I, it doesn't really ruin it too much, and it's not really an exciting chase anyway. Um, because it's, yeah, it's just cars driving on a road and, and Scaramanga looking in the rearview mirror every now and then and looking, you know, keeping an eye on things. Eventually, some police do get involved when they spot like the high speed chase. And again, they're not really a threat. They end up, I can't even remember how they're taken out in this. Do you remember? Uh, yeah. So oh God, I got it somewhere. Basically, somebody crashes, but they crash. It might be because of JW, actually. So somebody oh, kind of crashes yeah. and then it blocks the road and then it causes all the police cars to crash into them. So I think it's like JW is leaning out the window screaming and someone just kind of looks at him and gets distracted by it. And then that causes them to crash, which then blocks the road for the police. Right. There you go. Amazing. Really, <laughs> What a great stunt. Uh, so yeah, the chase goes on for a bit. They keep, they're trying to keep on Scaramanga's tail. It eventually ends up in that they are on opposite sides of this canal or river or whatever it is. Um, yeah, so Scaramanga's on one side. And, I mean, I, I've, I've deliberately not spoke about J.W. Pepper because he doesn't really do much. He's literally just yelling for, <laughs> yelling out the window for most of the scene. Uh, it's not as bad, I think, as the first bit with him, but it's still not great. Um, but we are getting up to like probably one of the most memorable parts of this film for a lot of people with uh, like the one car stunt that everyone talks about. So... Yeah, Bond's on the other side of this, this river. How is he going to get across? I think at one point, Pepper says, like, oh, the nearest bridge is two miles back. So Bond spots this sort of dilapidated bridge that's that's sort of turned a bit in the middle and and, and broken in the middle completely. And you get, you get the corkscrew car stunt where he drives over it and they did the stunt. You know, they actually did this stunt I think it was like one shot, one take, and they nailed it. But this car actually does drive and does a 360 corkscrew and land on the other side. And listen, it's a really cool stunt. But you know, the, um, you know what I'm going to mention? It's the one thing that everyone talks about with this this stunt is like the sound effect they used for it. Now I'm actually mm. going to say something controversial. I actually didn't mind it. <laughs> I didn't mind it. I think people make a bit of a mountain out of a molehill over this. Like, yeah, I it's think a city, when city you know effect. it's coming. 
is easier to just say, all right, I know they're going to play a slide whistle over this and it's done, but whatever. It's a cool stunt. I'll focus on that. But I think if you don't and it's the first time you're watching it, then it's like, well, what what was that? <laughs> Why did they yeah, play that sound? That is true. Although I do feel like if by this point you hadn't have kind of caught on that this film is, you know, very much leaning into the comedy, then I don't know what you've been watching. <laughs> but it is, it is, yeah. It, it doesn't ruin it for me, but it definitely is very, very noticeable. I mean, yeah, it's such a cool stunt. Like, that's the thing. Like, this is one of the best in all of the franchise, I would say. Um, which is why I think maybe people do focus on the whistle effect, because it's like, man, this should have been one of the best. And it still is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I still like it. But you're completely right what you're saying, though. This is this film's equivalent of the boat chase from Live and Let Die. This is the same format and it has some of the same issues for sure. It's not quite as bad as that one for me because that stunt's really cool and mm. it doesn't go on for as long. But it has the same sort of general pacing where everything's just longer than it should be. Yeah. And yeah. I like some of these elements. Like I like the setting. I think that's pretty cool. And I like the way they have Bond drive so crazily. So you have Scaramanga and Nick Naki one car and they actually drive quite calmly. Like, they're not going all over the place, but Bond is in the back, just, like, going crazy in this red car. And I kind of like this more aggressive driving style they have for Bond. I don't think we've seen anything quite so aggressive in any of the other films until this one. Um, and mm. so it leading to the corkscrew kind of totally makes sense with the way Bond is kind of quite recklessly driving. But, yeah, yeah it's just padded out in the same way the boat one was and has the same sort of pacing which kind of sucks a lot of it out just like just edit it down just get us to the key beats get us to the key stunts get rid of jw pepper <laughs> of course <laughs> uh, it's just kind of too much it just guy hamilton in these two films certainly has a way he likes to pace his um his chases and i feel like even the diamonds are forever one the one in vegas is kind of similar um and yeah he does it the same way here and it's just not a good way of doing it so there's good parts of it it's just yeah it's just kind of let down just due to how how they put it together yeah i would agree I, I, yeah i think it's it's not quite as bad as, as the speedboat from live that die no, um, no but it definitely does follow that that template anyway um so they they make it over the the uh the river with that cool stunt with the side whistle um but by that time i think you eventually see Scaramanga and, and Nicknack in their car, they've they've driven and, and snuck into this barn-looking building. I don't know what it is exactly. But you see him drive in there and park, and Nicknack goes out and pulls a lever or something like that, and you see something happening to the car. You can't really make out what's going on, but you see things moving and things attaching to it. Uh, Scaramanga, like, flips, does a button, and these dials flip on, on, the, uh, on the dashboard. Um, so, yeah, you know something's going to happen all whilst Bond and, and Pepper are still catching up to them. So they eventually do, and um, you get them to, like, you get a little bit of a comedy moment. Well, it's meant to be comedy. <laughs> I say comedy uh, very loosely, with Pepper, like, trying to act like a proper agent alongside Bond and uh, shimmying along and trying to be quiet and, and everything um, as they get to the door of this barn that they're in. Um, they're also being chased by more of the police of the area, um who eventually do catch up with them and they do the same sort of gag with pepper being you know i'll i'll handle this you know i'm i'm the sheriff let me let me take care of this let me talk to these guys and they just arrest him immediately <laughs> mm. they just stick a handcuff on him straight away thank god because i think that's this is it now this is that's the end of jw pepper um so yeah he'll be sorely missed um, jw pepper will not return <laughs> in the spy who loved me i would have appreciated that at the end of this just to be sure like, okay phew just want to double check um and as they're arresting as they're arresting uh pepper and, and bond still trying to get into this barn you work out what was going on with scaramanga's car and actually it was a big plane thing <laughs> that I don't know how to describe it. It was basically just a set of wings. And it's a just jet. wings, like giant yellow wings on giant the roof yellow of wings. the car. Yeah, they, they, they attached to the car and turned the car into a plane. And so kind of in a very Thunderbirds-esque manner, this uh, the barn, the doors 
drop down and everything opens up and there's like a runway and and yeah they just they fly off in this car this really stupid looking car plane thing well that's the thing right it, like you get the sh- like they did attach wings to a car but it can't fly so you just get shots of the car driving and then it cuts to a little model in the sky and mm. everyone on the ground just staring up at the sky to kind of set it it, it didn't bother me too much how bad it looked because it didn't look great I really like the shots of like Christopher Lee and Nick Knack driving the car so seriously and nonchalantly. <laughs> like it means nothing. Um, you know, those shots were kind of enough for me to enjoy it. I mean, I really like the concept of this. I kind of like how it's um, we, you know, the parallel to Bond, where Bond has his his Aston Martins and his gadgets, and and hey, Scaramanga's got his own little tricks and 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 inventions and stuff too. Like he can pull some stuff out of the bag when he needs to. Uh, and I like that. I just, it just doesn't look very good to me. Just, uh, and, and not even like the model shots in the sky. I think you, know, you can get away with that. I just think as as a design, like these really ugly yellow wings on top of the car. I don't know. They, I feel like they could have, like, where this works is, for example, the Lotus Esprit when that turns into a sub. I mean, it helps that a sub is you can you can blend that more easily into a car. But that is just a cool looking vehicle, and therefore like it turns into a cool looking little submarine. Whereas this just looks like a car with something bolted on top. So I like the premise, but I think it could have maybe been designed better. Well, I think if you just switched out the colours, you would have been Yeah, that's there. a big thing. Yeah. It's a brown car. Like a brown car. <laughs> I know this was the 70s, but like a brown car. And then they attach <laughs> bright yellow wings to the top of it. So it's yellow and brown, which yeah. is supposed to be like this spy gadget that of a flying car. It's like... Just paint it white or silver or something. Or black, you know, make it like a stealth thing. Yeah, Many different colours that would have worked rather than brown and yellow. (laughs) I mean, that is the 70s in a nutshell, isn't it? (laughs) Oh, so ugly. Yeah. So, yeah, so they're flying away. They're basically, they've gotten away. And we see Goodnight on the walkie-talkie because she's in the boot still. They've they've kidnapped her, basically. So she jumps on the walkie-talkie saying, hey, I think we've stopped moving. I'm going to try and get out. So she picks the boot open and sees that she's in the sky flying. What? What? <laughs> yeah, not today. Good night. So just shuts it again. <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of made me laugh. I thought that was quite fun. It's so like blatant in terms of being a comedy bit where she's like, "Oh, open," because I think we've stopped. But I don't know. There's something funny about someone in the boot of a car flying in the sky. And just opening it and just seeing that they're like miles above the ground. I don't know. I liked it. Would I have liked it more if she got sucked out? I don't know. <laughs> just no. <laughs> the end. Yeah. The Solex, the Solex was destroyed. Was, yeah, yeah. The Solex was never found and the energy crisis continued. <laughs> <laughs> James Bond will return. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that probably would have been better, but. I do feel like this is a bit weird though, because I I am enjoying this like kind of campy city stuff more than you for this film. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just the character I don't like. I I do like a lot of the camp, but yeah, I am find I am finding more holes in it than I thought I would. That's true. Well, what's that cheese with holes in it? There's uh, E Dam. Yeah. yeah, I guess it's E Dam cheese. This film. <sighs> e Dam. E Dam. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Who yuck. We're cr- we're, <laughs> we're criticizing bad comedy while coming up with some of our own, so that's good. Yeah. Hypocrites. Here's how you do bad comedy, Guy Hamilton. <laughs> so, and then we get another great shot. So it cuts to M with big old wide, wide eyes, visibly upset and mad, and being briefed about what happened. And basically saying, and then, yes, yeah, Scaramanga then flew away in a car. And then <laughs> just <laughs> he is, Q yeah. tries to chime in and it's just like, oh, shut up, Q. I love that. I love, <laughs> shut up, Q. He says it again later. I just shut up, Q. <laughs> yeah. And then it's just like, oh, they found the car, but they, so they found the car, but they don't know where Goodnight has gone to. And then Q's like, it's perfectly possible for there to be a flying car and stuff. And it's just like, oh, shut up, Q. <laughs> M's blood pressure must be not great. <laughs> he's so mad. And he's just because Q keeps... It's that nerd thing again, isn't it? It's that character that they've really framed for him where he's just trying to be 
Like he's very knowledgeable, so he just tries to speak. And in the other films, we get more eye rolls and just people walking away from him as he's talking. But now that he's in that room and M's mad, he's just like no patience. There's no, no like polite, like, hmm, yes, interesting cue. Dust. Yes, great. It's just like, just shut up, Q. <laughs> uh, I love Q, but uh M shouting at him to shut up is so good. I'm do you know what I'm I'm realizing more with this this podcast is I'm liking M way more than I thought I did. M's great in these films. Oh yeah, like every scene. There's not been a bad scene with M. Yeah. I couldn't say that for like most characters, but M is is always on point. Oh yeah. So they basically say that well somebody then comes in saying we found Goodnight's signal. So because Goodnight had the tracker, initially they were like it doesn't work. But someone then comes in and says, we found the signal and brings a couple of maps in and says it's off the coast of mainland China in these kind of small islands of which Bond says, well, let's go in and get them. Let's let's go in. And the uh, M's like, well, the PM would hang me for this. I can't do it. Of which Bond suggests, well, officially, you, you won't know a thing, M. And then it just ends. Uh, I kind of expected a little bit more back and forth. But it is just like, we should Bond's like, we should do this. The PM's going to get me for this. And Bond's like, well, you won't know. I expected a little bit more back and forth, but I guess they just wanted to get to the finale. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're reaching that point now. Like, speed up. <laughs> it's like they want to get this done. Yeah, because it is quite a long one, to be honest. So yeah, we just cut to Bond flying a plane heading to these islands. So it's kind of agreed that he could go. And we get another version of the main theme here. I mean, it's nice that they're remixing this theme. Uh, we get what we've had before where they don't just straight up play the theme. We get a few different versions. And this is another one of those. I don't remember any of them at all. But we do get that Man with a Golden Gun theme, but remixed as we go. And, and we get another one uh, for this one as Bond is flying this plane heading towards the islands. Yeah. And and there's, there's some great shots of this, you know, the plane... Th- flying over these islands we were mentioned before how it's it's an easy it's an easy win for the filmmakers because it's such a interesting looking landscape and vista so all they need to do is just record it they don't really need to do much more i think we said the same about like the alps and stuff like that um but yeah you can't deny that they they had a, a good choice for for where to set the ending of this film um and i think even to this day like the place where scaramanga's meant to be is called james bond island so oh, is it? It definitely left a like a, a tourism hotspot there. Right, well, look, yeah, it looks amazing. So basically, yeah. it's just two small islands next to each other, but they've got these very like tall rocks. That's not that's kind of underselling it because they're huge. <laughs> um, but there's like a load of trees on them as well. Just look it up. Don't don't listen to me describing rocks. Like, go look it up. <laughs> uh, it, it looks amazing, like as you yeah. say, and all the clear water around it as well, and other islands nearby. Like, it's just. A, a, like a perfect location uh, for a, a lair or a James Bond villain lair. Absolutely. But if you do want to hear me talk about rocks, that rock podcast, that's coming soon. Um, Am I on that one? No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> We're still in no- negotiations on the rock podcast. Oh, okay, great. All right. It's called rocks. And then in brackets, not the music, the, the rocks. <laughs> I can't wait to download that. <laughs> Somehow the episodes are longer than this podcast. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> Impossible. It's a free part of that one. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so Bond is flying over. And as you say, we get some great aerial shots. It's something that's been lacking from the series for a while, maybe since on a Majesty Secret Service. But we do get some really nice kind of aerial shots. Um, and it does look amazing, this place, as we say, with the, the islands themselves. But we see some Chinese soldiers, right? It's yeah, like they're the meant to be in, yeah, they're meant to be in Chinese waters, yeah. Yeah, so and then they radio Scaramanga saying there's a plane coming. And Scaramanga replies saying, nope, that's all good. Let the plane come through. Um, and then he says, the plane won't leave. He will arrive, but he won't be leaving. Mm. And... Bond then lands on the beach. Basically, he lands on the water with the plane and lands on the beach, the same beach we saw from the very beginning of the film. And Knickknack is there with some lovely champagne for everyone to enjoy. And yeah, yeah go on. I was, I was going to say, like, it's still, you know, 
same thing as before, making him carry these bottles and everything. Poor guy. Mm. Well, this is what we're doing, though. Like, the whole beginning of the film started with Nick Nack bringing over champagne on this beach. And we're going to see this throughout this sequence at the end. We're just seeing a lot of the parallels play out. Yeah. And they start it straight away. Nick Nack on the island with champagne. Yeah. Which is cool. So we then see a gun pointing out of somewhere, which then fires... And that fires the champagne cork and opens the champagne. And Scaramanga shows up saying, ah, I'm just having a bit of fun. I couldn't resist. But I really like that moment. It just shows that. Because we haven't really seen it all that much. You know, he's supposed to be a master assass assassin with this golden gun. But we haven't really seen too much of it. We did see him assassinate someone, yes. But most of the shots have been quite basic but they do talk about how he is good at shooting and things like that and difficult shots and stuff but yeah it's kind of nice to see an example of it in a more playful setting yeah that was definitely that's more um visually interesting than shooting the fingers off of of the bond statue at the beginning like this one actually blends into the story nicely as you say it's a good good opportunity that like, tiny little thing but adds to the character hmm but well, we get a little bit of a different version of Scaramanga here. So now it's Bond, Nick Nack and Scaramanga hanging out. And uh, as per usual, Scaramanga gives Bond a tour of the island. Mm. Uh, but we get a very happy, upbeat Scaramanga. I really like this version of him where before he was a bit more calm and stuff, but slightly deranged, but kind of calm. But here he's just like so happy to see Bond. Like it's an old friend he hasn't seen in 10 years. And it's just like, ah, oh, welcome, welcome. Splendid, splendid. And it's all like, we have so much to discuss. Like, let's spend a few pleasant hours hanging out, which Bond kind of agrees with. But I really like this kind of change with him where he's just so happy that this is all finally playing out. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? Like he's, he's, he's giddy at the, at the thought of what he's able to do now, you know, have this, have this duel with Bond eventually. And it kind of... Yeah, he's on his own island. He's got everything he wants. He's a happy man. It's Christmas for him, basically. I thought Christmas came only once a year. Sorry. <laughs> I don't Sorry. Know. Just I don't whenever, know. whenever I hear the word Christmas in the sense of Bond, I just think of that awful line. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no. I can't, yeah. <laughs> I'm jumping way ahead there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So basically, Bond and them are, are talking while he's super happy and. Uh, he's like, where's Goodnight? And he's like, ah, she's somewhere. She can't leave. We're on these islands, so she's about. So she know we know she's okay and has just been left to her own uh, devices. And he then explains about how this island is completely self-sufficient and everything like that. And we have ample supply of electricity here. And they step into this big, large power station, which is a solar energy station, of which Bond then comments, this should run a few electric toothbrushes, which... <laughs> Good one, Bond. Yeah, nice one, Bond. Strong. <laughs> Starting strong with this. I do uh, like this whole scene in, in where Scaramanga is is um showing off all this tech stuff and and just letting just letting Bond do what he wants, like giving Bond the uh the satisfaction of sounding smart and, and Scaramanga's like, Oh, I, I don't know what they do really. I, I I think it's this thing or oh I I think that's how that works and just letting Bond be like, Well actually, yeah, so helium and all this sort of stuff. It's just he's really he's just so teasing him at this point. Yeah, there's just two kind of types of confidence on display is how I kind of took it where yes, Scaramanga owns all this. So basically by becoming chairman of that company that he killed High Fat for, he now owns all this like technology and things like that. That's how he got it. Uh, but yeah, again, we get two different types of confidence, I feel like. Bond is doing the more traditional, oh, I know all of this stuff, and just starts saying all these facts about how power plants work. Uh, but Scaramanga has a nice confidence to him where it's just like, I don't know, because I don't need to know. Um, mm. I think you're right, he's being playful with Bond and kind of let him have his moment, because he wants to see the legendary 007 in action. Yeah. But I think like at the same time, it's just like, I don't care. I'm not going to learn this That's stuff because line. I'm an assassin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's my line i don't care yeah no you're, you're definitely right i mean it's it's great that we're seeing all this stuff of um of scaramanga now like yeah i mean he has been in the film more than i remembered uh, as you say but th this is like this is the juicy stuff like this is the best bit is is actually christopher lee and roger moore like in their element at the end here hmm. so we get one detail of bond which is important where they says there's all this liquid helium 
which is like minus 350 degrees, I, I think he says. Um, so that's something worth noting because that comes back later. Mm. Uh, but then they leave and they talk about what the plan is. And Scaramanga's like, yep, I'm going to get a load of people here to see the Solex because the Solex is here um, on the island as part of this power plant and give it to the highest bidder, basically, which Bond says, well, maybe the oil people will want it off you just to keep off the market. He's like, yeah, I guess, I, I suppose, you know, that could be true. Um, and then they eventually get to this kind of where the Solex is, which Scaramanga then activates it where this solar panel comes out of this rock, which is so clearly fake, but I was like, it's fine. It, it does the job, yeah. Yeah, so it's this kind of actual rock, but they've kind of like superimposed this solar panel coming up out of it, but it just, it's fake. It's fine, <laughs> but it, it's just not, not real. Um, and we see, yeah, so the laser that like, when it, okay, I'm, I've got to make sure I get this right because it comes up again. So when he activates this and the solar panels come out and reflect the sun, that turns this all on, which shoots a laser into the Solex and kind of generates the power. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. It's it's that it's a typical end of end of Bond movie science spiel. But all you need to know is yeah, like there's a Solex in there and that's <laughs> there's a big nasty beam that can appear. Yeah, you're right. But then we get another great moment with Scaramanga where he's just so happy, so happy with all this. And he's like, let me show you the power. And there's just a laser there next to of them. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So not? he opens up all the, the shutters and gets on his laser and big old grin on his face, moves it along, aims it at Bond's plane, and then blows it up with the laser. And Bond just looks slightly concerned, like, hmm, oh dear. Mm. Uh, and Scaramanga was like, yeah, I blew up your plane. I wrote down, I, I can't remember who said this, but I wrote down, now that's all I call solar power. I imagine that was Bond that said that. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it's one of them. They're, they're just both having a blast. But the effect on it is terrible because there's no laser that actually comes out. They just clearly rigged the plane to blow up and then just detonated it while they had the laser, the laser device pointing at it. No laser actually comes out of it. Oh, I didn't spot that. Mm. Yeah. Do you know what? I think I'd rather that than a really badly put on laser on top. Yeah, I mean, we saw that stuff from Diamonds Are Forever, right? Like, that probably would have been what we would have got if they did yeah. add it in. Yeah. So after that little demonstration with the laser, uh, Scaramanga, yeah, well, there's a little a little bell and knickknacks. Knickknacks sorted lunch for everyone. So it's time for lunch. Uh with good night so they all go sit down at the table and this is this is where you kind of get the, the the dialogue here between bond and scaramanga is really you get into the meat of like well to scaramanga they're the same sort of person sort of thing and you get the, the full-on like parallel universe sort of thing like one is one really that like, different from the other um because yeah basically scaramanga's uh, I can't remember how exactly it turns into being nasty. I think it's just like a couple of little lines here and there, but um, yeah, basically Scaramanga showing off all of the money and then saying, well, you know, I've got all this and, and you work for Her Majesty's government and get a pittance for a paycheck and that sort of thing. You're not so different, you and I. And obviously Bond, Bond does not agree with that and just calls him out as like an assassin and, and he kills bad people. Um as as an agent as a as a mi6 agent and it's i can't really remember like the intricacies intricacies of this conversation but it is nice how like you can tell the it's like ramping up intention and and this it's all starting out with smiles and everything but eventually turns nasty because uh it basically at, at the end of it Scaramanga's like, yeah, I, I really, I, my ultimate goal, like my ultimate hunting trophy, is is you. Like, I, I want to be the man who killed James Bond, and that's how we eventually lead to um to a duel, which is what he suggests to do, like pistols at dawn type of situation. Um, but yeah, I I I don't know what you think, but there's just like, this seems really nice in that way of of amping up things quite quite naturally. I felt. Well, it's basically Scaramanga kind of ranting about his ideas. And you just kind of get that sense that Bond doesn't agree. And the more Scaramanga kind of rants and push, because he, Scaramanga, as you say, 
they're both assassins, which I don't think Bond would agree with. But Scaramanga is just being like, yeah, me and you, we're the same person. I really enjoy killing. You really enjoy killing. It's just you do it for no money and I do it for a ton of money. Of which Bond says I kill for my government and tries to justify that from a moral standpoint. Which Scaramanga is just like, yeah, whatever. You just enjoy killing, mate like me <laughs> which is when the guns come out but then roger Mo- or james bond also says there's a four letter word and you're full of it <laughs> <laughs> which is a unexpected but great line uh, from bond yeah yeah uh, great delivery by roger moore there um, i mean the only thing i would say is i wish this scene was longer but it, yeah it, it does work for what it is it just definitely we could have had more than this more of this definitely yeah like this is this is the crux of forget about the solex and, and all that mcguffin stuff like this is the crux of the film theme or or what i think it should have been anyway like this element of there being someone that matches bond and thinks that they're like bond and, and gets them into the situation so you're right like i would have loved to have had the film focus more on this um but instead we have an energy crisis so oh well yeah and one last thing about this scene is that the the wine cups were really ugly and i didn't like them (laughs) what what i thought about this scene is so yeah at at the end uh scaramanga's like yep we're gonna have a duel and and one of us is gonna kill the other um but then he's like, but first, let's finish lunch. <laughs> it's like, that's an awkward rest of the lunch. What do you talk about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's Bond, isn't it? Like, Scaramanga's like, let's have a, a duel. It's the only true test of gentlemen, of which Bond's like, I doubt you qualify, but I guess we'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> but Bond's like, well, let me have some food first. <laughs> <laughs> let me just finish my mushrooms here. Yeah, let's have the mushrooms. But, but with the wine glasses, the reason why I say they're ugly... Uh, okay. is because they're like metal and solid like you can't see it it's like these really horrible metal looking cups and i'm just like Ugh. for wine I, I guess some people do it but it's it's more 70s style decor and trends that is bad and i know it's a weird thing to pick up on but i was like oh like but there's so many cups on the cake there's like 10 of these on the table these ugly metal cups i'm like Ugh. why uh, bad well, knickknack you're, you make it well that's a good point because it's like, well, Bond would never, Bond would never pick such glasses. So you could say, you know, Scaramanga has all this money, but he can't buy taste. Ah, uh, mm. maybe. Mm-hmm. And then Nick Nag pours Bond some for yuck, and he starts off, <laughs> and then Bond goes for yuck, for yuck. <laughs> I really, want, I really want that to exist. Do you think that actually exists? I hope so. <laughs> I hope so too. Um, anyway, let's get on with this. So we're near the end now. So we're getting to um, the duel. We we'll just get straight onto it. Um, Bond and Scaramanga on the beach. It's a really cool shot, back to back, uh, as they're about to do their twenty paces. Uh, I think at this point, I think at this point, Goodnight's been. Where is Goodnight? She with the scientist guy. Yeah, I think she's with the creepy scientist because the whole time she's in a bikini for some reason. Yes, and that's spends right. a good chunk of this just being stared at by some guy in a bikini. Oh, like she's in a bikini and some guy is just staring at her very blatantly. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so good night's out of the question for now, and it's just uh, it's just Bond and Scaramanga on the beach. Nick Nack's there, um, officiating the duel and and starts the countdown. So you get you get the cool. I mean, it's like it's an inherently cool scene, right? You know, two two agents having a duel like this. So doesn't really need to do too much apart from that. Um, you know, the, the golden gun against the Walther PPK. Uh, and then they get to the last few paces and Bond turns around and Scaramanga's not there. He's run off. He's run off. And that leads to sort of the final act of, of this little uh, scene at Scaramanga's lair because now it's it's Bond. Basically, as Tom mentioned, it's it's a repeat of the the beginning of the film where we're getting Bond exploring around Scaramanga's base and and uh, Scaramanga sort of, well, knick-knack toying with both, the both of them and making it a challenge. So as much as I love the dual scene, and like you say, the setup was so cool, Roger Moore and Christopher Lee back-to-back with guns pacing away, so good, mm. so, so good. Um, but it kind of ends really awkwardly where, yeah, the whole point is that Scaramanga used this to kind of run away to make the real duel being the fun house, but you hear a gunshot and then they cut away. I think they're trying to add a load of intrigue to it, but 
it, the editing made it seem odd. Like I didn't really get a good sense that Scaramanga had run off because I don't think they really show it. It's just a bit. Roger Moore turns and shoots, and then it just kind of cuts off, and then Roger just kind of leaves, and it's a bit like it, it's a bit awkwardly done that part of it. But yeah, it, it doesn't ruin it for me because just the idea of it's so cool. You know what would have been funny? Have you seen those? Have you seen those videos where it's like, imagine if Batman didn't get away in time. You know when Batman does a thing where someone turns around and he's not there, and so you just see like the tail end of Batman running away out of a shot. <laughs> It'd be yeah. funny if they done that, and Scaramanga's like still just running past a rock. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so yeah, with that, uh, Bond is now left to. Well, I think Nick Knack comes up. That, that, yeah, he gets up, finds Nick Knack and. Nick Knack says, you know, oh, if you kill him, if you kill Scaramanga, this is all mine. So sort of goading him on to, to go and kill Scaramanga uh, and set him up for this this funhouse duel um, because then he quickly goes and runs off into his little um, his little control board ready to do all the mirrors and skeletons and Al Capone and all that sort of stuff. And Bond is left to, to go in and start exploring. Yeah, this is kind of implied at the start of the film a bit more where the whole point is that Nick Knack and Scaramanga, yes, they work together, but basically Nick Knack is is trying to bring people in to kill him. So what we saw at the very start was basically Scaramanga testing himself where Nick Knack is trying to find assassins to take on Scaramanga to kill Scaramanga and Scaramanga likes it kind of as a sport, basically. Mm. So Bond is supposed to be like the ultimate person for him to take on, but that's what that intro sequence was trying to convey that it was, yes, yeah, Scaramanga is kind of someone who loves playing these games with assassins and wants, wants more and more challenge as he goes. Yeah. So, yeah, so we see Scaramanga inside the fun house um, and we see the fake Bond once again, like the fake kind of model of Bond. Uh, and Nick Knack shows Bond to the entrance, of which Bond doesn't have much patience for him. He's like, I've never killed a midget before, but there can always be a first time. And he's like, oh, monsieur... <laughs> I forgot we haven't that. really talked about Nick Nag, have we? We haven't actually. It's been three and a half hours, pretty much, and we haven't talked about Nick Nag. What What do you think of Nick Nag overall? Well, I was going to say that I uh, we're very close to where this goes wrong, but for the most part of the film, I don't really. I think they've handled the character quite well in that it's like it's an easy target, right? Like a midget, you can make so many jokes about that, and there's a couple bits that you could say like that they're sort of exploiting that. But I think for the most part, they don't, which is quite surprising, given that this is a film from the 1970s. It's like an easy target, I would have thought. And so as I was watching this, I was quite impressed. I was like, yeah, it's quite a creepy little character. Um, little in the sense of like, not physical, but I mean like little as in as yeah, a small character. Part, yeah. Small part. Uh, and then it's kind of, it kind of ruined at the end, which we'll get to. That's that's my thoughts. Yeah, I well, kind not, of agree. Ruined, I, actually, but, yeah. I was surprised that I liked Nick Knack as much as I did. Not a ton, yeah. but it's a very different type of henchman, and I can at least appreciate that. Mm. And like you say, they don't spend the whole time being like, oh, you're tiny or whatever, or and things like that. So it, it does kind of work, especially because he wears all these suits and stuff like that, and he's kind of the butler. And they, he has a nice relationship with Scaramanga, this whole idea of them of him bringing assassins to this island and stuff to kill scaramanga that's kind of a nice relationship so it's not one of my favorites by any means but i was kind of surprised he's weird with his like yeah, yeah he's meant to be weird um but you know i actually quite quite liked it in the end yeah so yeah so nick knack yeah leads bond into the house and bond then goes through what we saw in the intro so all the lights go red he then sees Scaramanga on the wall and Bond enters in the same entrance with all these kind of doorways and we see him going through those same kind of scenes where Nick Knack is laughing over the PA system. We see the cowboy come out of the saloon. Although this time, the the cameras, like we see it on the cameras instead, which I think was really smart. Like we see a lot, like we've already seen most of this stuff right from the intro. So instead they show most of it from Nick Knack's point of view instead looking at the camera screens. I thought that was a really cool way of mixing this up while doing the same thing again. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. So Nick Knack says, oh, I think Bond only has three bullets left because the Golden Gun only has one bullet, right? Yeah. Uh, so Bond, I think, had to have been f uh, firing and things like that. So there's mirrors everywhere. Bond's now fully in this thing. The camera is following Bond everywhere he goes. 
and he walks into this like clear glass panel kind of goes behind it and sees this big drop and all this scaffolding so basically starts climbing down the scaffolds and because he's down these scaffolds he's off camera and Nick Nack can't find Bond anymore on the camera so he's kind of frantically trying to find Bond but Bond has basically disappeared and as Bond is climbing down he drops his gun completely and we get this very loud sound of it like clanging all the way down mm. which we then cut to Scaramanga who hears the gun and very smartly that's when it kind of starts going to Scaramanga's point of view so we've seen this from Nick Knack and Bond's point of view so far but now the focus is on Scaramanga's point of view so he's looking for his golden gun because Nick Knack is testing him and he's trying to test himself and yeah he's just kind of looking around and trying to find the gun and Bond and we see Nick Knack again still can't find Bond we see the American gangsters again from before and it's a lot of very slow tense shots and I absolutely love this scene because of it. It's very, it's a lot of slow stuff of Bond and stuff, but then it's a lot of slow stuff of Scaramanga. And eventually he's walking around and we see that fake Bond model again. But from but we, we have a camera shot from it from behind looking at Scaramanga and suddenly it turns and shoots Scaramanga. Hey. And it turns out it was the real Bond. Bond decided to play fake and it caught Scaramanga out and he was able to shoot and kill him. And this whole scene's just excellent. Just yep. really, really excellent. A really great payoff to the intro. Really great tension here. Really fun to see both these two. The way Bond out tricks him is just... It's 10 out of 10 stuff for, for me. Yeah, totally agree. I, I mean, I, I put... In my notes, I put it's over too quickly. I could have had so much more of just this. It's so good. Um, and I think part of the reason for that along with like the cool set and you know the the idea of using the statue which was as we said it was kind of planted as a seed at the beginning of the film so it makes sense why it's here um even though you really think about it what how did he get that model of bond we'll forget that um <laughs> all that stuff is great but what i also really like is that this is we haven't really had this sort of showdown with a bond and and the villain really there's been uh different sorts of fights you know there's been hand to hand fights and and stuff like that but this is like an actual proper, both of them are, are at risk here. Both of them are, are using their skills, right? This is like a proper shootout. They're both assassins, as, as it's been described as. So, yeah, it's just a nice change of pace. And and as you say, like just the shooting of it. And it could have easily just been the same again from the beginning. But they did it in such a way as to keep it a little bit more uh, visually interesting. Definitely. It's so good. Really, really like this scene. And like you say, yeah, it's a very different type of ending scene between villains where we had the last one with Kananga where they just have a bit of a weak fight and then he blows up and stuff and it's a bit weird. So I appreciate that. You know, that one was a more low-key ending for the villain. It wasn't a big shootout and stuff. And this one is that, but or low-key again, but just so smartly done. Like, it's doing so much more with less. And if you're going to have a less action-oriented scene and a less action-oriented film, this was just kind of a fantastic way of doing it, of being very slow and just pitting two people against each other that you've built up throughout the film. So it's just, yeah, my hat's off to it entirely. Yep, 100% agreed. So yeah, that's it. Scaramanga's, Scaramanga's been shot. Um, the rest of the film now is a little bit of a... I wrote notes for it, but good goodness. Um, basically, uh, after that point, well, I think we cut back to to Goodnight, who, as you say, is with the creepy... She's with the creepy science man <laughs> who's been just ogling her really awkwardly. Uh, and he gets distracted looking at some sort of, like, panel. Uh, so she takes this... This is the one, you know, I was going to say the one good thing she does. It ends up causing problems but you know good for her she actually does something useful and she knocks out the guard or the the scientist man i want to say his name's cree or cray or cra or something uh, yeah whatever uh she knocks jack him out frost. Whilst... It's called jack frost. <laughs> whilst he's not looking and he falls over the side of this kind of like stairwell thing and straight into one of the big helium tank pits that very helpfully <laughs> like as he does that and it's like bubbling and all that doesn't look good there's like a sign so clearly in the background, just in case anyone has missed it who's who's been watching, um, that it says like, 
it says something. It's just it really made me laugh. It was like something I'd expect to see in Austin Powers, where it was to prevent prop. What I even wrote down to prevent prompt criticality. You know, temperature must be kept below zero. I just think like that's a good place sign there. Well done. Um, no so yeah. bodies. Do not throw body. <laughs> bodies will cause this to blow up. I mean, that's basically it, right? Do not push bodies into this. <laughs> um, so yeah, that starts bubbling, and you get the impression. Oh no, something is not gonna go very well uh so bond and goodnight are reunited and obviously bond still wants to get the solex uh which is in that kind of weird machine that scaramanga was showing off earlier so they go and find it or whilst the the base itself is starting to like overload and blow up and sirens and smoke and everything so they find the big machine with the reflector bond jumps down to where the Solex is, it's kind of in this lower level, and tries to start unscrewing where the Solex is, but it's quite tough, so he's like banging it with his gun and everything like that. Um, Good Knight is peering over, um, like leaning over, and <laughs> uh, with her bottom, accidentally presses a button on the control panel behind her, which activates the reflector that we saw earlier, uh, which will obviously start reflecting the sun and then causing that big scary beam to come down right where Bond is and get in the way of uh, getting the Solex. So, yeah, I mean, this whole bit is just so... I feel like we've had the good bit now and it's just... needs. I know it needs to have this bit, but it's just I really just didn't care by this point. There I am no. again, well, I don't care. Um, but yeah, so Bond's there, the beam's in the way. Uh, he's yelling at Goodnight, you know, find a way to stop it, press all the buttons, all the damn buttons. He's getting really annoyed with her. Uh, and it does stop, albeit temporarily, because a cloud passes by the sun and stops the reflection, which gives Bond a chance to carry on getting the Solex. And there's a little bit like a, it's meant to be tense, like, oh, the cloud, it's passing, it's going to come back, the sun's going to come back out soon, is he going to burn Bond? Like, you get these shots of Bond so clearly over the spot where the beam's going to come down, uh, like a bird's eye view. Uh, and it does suddenly like snap back into into existence the beam, but he's he's got it. It's all good. He's got the Solex. Um, so as the base explodes, they escape. They get out of the island. Don't think it's I missed just anything with there. This did I? See, yeah, it's the timing of it, isn't it? Really, and it's more just good night being ditzy and stupid and fumbling her way through. And it, you just don't want to see it anymore. Oh, it's yeah. like, I didn't really mind that stuff so much earlier in the film, but when we've just had this and we're just trying to wrap it up, just like, just move on, just go and get the Solex and leave and have the base explode. That's all you need. But yeah. it takes ages, just Bond trying to get out this thing, just whacking it with his gun like an ape. And then Goodnight being like, I don't know what to do. Oh, my butt hit the hit the master <laughs> button. Oopsie, oopsie. It's just like, oh, just get rid of it. Like, oh, come on. Like, just get on the boat. Leave. Yeah, totally. Yeah, just needs to move on. So with everyone or everything blowing up because they had five minutes, they get onto the the junk. Is that right? Mm, yeah. So they get onto the junk. So the ship that we saw Scaramanga use before and sailed away. And it's Bond and Goodnight on the boat. And they say, oh, we'll be in Hong Kong in eight hours. What are we going to do? So they're on the bed kissing and, and things like that. And... Bond's in a, a lovely robe, I have to say. Oh, there's the robe. See, I thought when you said robes earlier, you were talking about the um, like the martial arts robes. Well, it's, yeah, there is that robe. Uh, there's many, we do many get, different meanings, yeah. Yeah, we do get a robe at the end. But as they're in bed, the camera pans up and we see that Knickknack is on the on the boat. Oh, my and goodness. And he's in the roof. What? And I know. He made it, I guess. And he puts a knife in his mouth, which I'm assuming that's not a real knife because he that gets real up in his mouth. Mm. And if that was a real sharp knife, he would be in that would be horrendous. Like it looks it looks really bad because he's just shoving this knife so directly into his mouth. I'm just like, oh god, that makes me uncomfortable. Um But yeah, he then puts the knife in his mouth and then takes it out and jumps down. Or no, sorry, Good Knight sees him, screams, and then he jumps down. And then Good Knight starts well, they have a fight, basically. Which is yeah. Bond. Yeah, go on. No, I was just saying if you could call it a fight. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's fair. Yeah. So Bond gets a chair, a wooden chair, and kind of smashes it. So he only has like the back bit. And he has the knife, but Nick Knack just starts running around from the room. 
and hides under a sofa and then Bond just kind of jabs underneath the sofa but Nicknack kind of runs away and gets to the wine bottles and starts throwing wine bottles at Bond which he just uses his broken chair to block until eventually uh, Bond gets a big suitcase slowly walks up to Nicknack and just locks him in the suitcase and all throughout this Nicknack is shouting stuff like I'll kill you I'll kill you and this like high pot high pitched uh, French accent, which makes it all very silly. Mm. And, and there's sort of like a, a doddery music as well, isn't there? There's like a it's meant to be funny music playing now. Yeah, like Nick Nack does have a theme. Uh, he does have a musical theme. It's just so subtle and not really used that often that I don't know if they played it here, but they do play in other scenes. Like he does have a musical oh, piece. Okay. Oh right. Um, uh, along with him, but yeah, he calls him a big bully, and I mean this bit made me laugh where he's in the suitcase he's like oh let me out you big bully and he's just like shut up (laughs) (laughs) it's another blunt bond moment and i'm not gonna say this scene is good but it's shorter than i remember yeah like i remember this going on for ages maybe it's just because it's the very end of the film but it is actually quite quick for what it is yeah i was exactly the same i I was dreading this bit because i knew i knew there was something that happened on the boat at the end I was like, oh no, we're so close, please no. But it was, it, yeah, rip it off like a plaster. It was quite short. I just, as I say, they had so much of the film where they, they didn't do this sort of gag and then right at the end they had to squeeze it in about fitting him in a suitcase. It's just like, oh, you, you were so close. You were so close, film, and he just couldn't make it. Yeah, nearly out the door. And, yeah. and just to, you know, my point stands as well. They did this along with the other films where they give you like two endings and then both of them kind of suffer. This one isn't as bad as Live and Let Die or anything like that. But again, I don't like this trope of, and then the henchman comes back. But with this one, at least it's very short and brief. Although to be fair, I did like the fight with Teehee, so maybe I'm a hypocrite. And, but yeah, it's it's a little bit of an awkward ending, mostly because of that Solek scene and, and this scene as well. And they don't kind of tie it together too well. I, I was at this point of the film where it was, the, the thing that annoyed me most about this scene was the fact that they're, you know, they're, they're barefoot and there's so much broken glass everywhere. <laughs> Put some shoes Nightmare. on, please. Come on. Oh. So, yeah, so that's it, basically. So he gets rid of, gets rid of him, uh, leaves the room and then comes back. And then they start kissing again and a phone goes off. A phone just pops up next to the bed. Bond answers and it's M. It's like, are you there, Bond? And great job on that mission and all that and asked for good night and bond's like oh he's right there or she's just coming or no i blew that a bit didn't i i ruined that joke uh she's go you know she's going to be on her way to the phone and emma's speaking on the phone and bond then picks it up again and says she's just coming sir and goes back to to kissing i think we get some like m patiently waiting on the phone footage as well <laughs> just yeah. him just waiting like hmm. which ah uh, i'm glad yeah. they ended on m that's a that's nice they brought him back yeah and he then m's like what's going on where are you of which bond picks up the phone and says good night sir because her name's good night oh yeah yeah it all oh. comes together i see why they did that now yeah it, <laughs> what a payoff what a payoff. I mean, quite why M had a direct line to Scaramanga's boat. We, we won't question that. Never mind. I mean, they don't know what it looks like, but they know his phone number. Yep, just so Bond can say goodnight while kissing a woman called goodnight. Ah, the end. And we see Nick Knack is just hanging from, like, in a basket on top of the ship. Just a bit of a sad shot, really. Is he still mumbling something as well? Like still, he might be. Yeah, yeah. he's just called mad, just in the top, and and then yeah, there we go. The main, the the main theme, the man with the golden gun starts playing, although a slightly different version of it. Yeah, it's a little, a little intro to the outro in a way. Yeah, yeah, I think it's talking a bit more about James Bond instead, and then it goes into the the song again, and and that's it. Credits roll. James Bond will return in the Spy Who Loved Me, and and that's it. That's the man with the golden gun. Yeah, so there you are. I can't remember who went first for, uh, last time. Was it me? Oh, well, I went first on diamonds, so you went. You must have gone yeah. first with live and let die. So I'll so, go first. On this yeah, one. what did you think? So it's quite interesting because I feel like we haven't had much to say about this film um, as we've gone along. So 
this might end up being our longest episode, which will be depressing if that's true. But uh, yeah, I feel like we <laughs> haven't had much to really say. And it's because it's another one that is quite unremarkable, like Live and Let Die. It's very much that template, just kind of with a different story and a different setting and villain and things like that. But I think the main thing I would kind of take away from this film is that this could have been my number one. I honestly see oh. enough elements in it that I probably could have put it above from Russia with love if we were in a different universe and this was handled a bit differently because I love the idea of the story and I with with the man with the golden gun and I love Scaramanga and Christopher Lee and things like that and some of these scenes are really effective and yes it's a more low-key film but I'm definitely open to a lower key less action oriented type of James Bond film but this just has some of the same problems that Live and Let Die had, where it's just bloated, just really, really bloated. And the Bond girl stuff bothers me a lot. Not so much Goodnight, but the, the other woman, like terrible, terrible part of the film. And Goodnight should have been improved as well. And I don't really like the main theme as well, which doesn't help. But I see all the elements here where it's assassin versus assassin. And some of these scenes really, really do work. And I do like Roger Moore in this film, Christopher Lee and stuff. And Nick Nack warmed on me as well. And there was a good stunt with the boat as well. Like, oh, all the ideas are here. This could have been my number one. It's just a really enjoyable, low-key, less or action-oriented film. But there's just too many stuff that doesn't work. It's too bloated, too long. And it kind of just ends up being a bit disappointing i think would be the word i would use not just not terrible not even really bad there's still enough stuff i like but it's just a big disappoint like big disappointment because all the elements are there for what i think could have been a quite different kind of more old school style of bond adventure that would have worked really well so i guess i gotta rank it yeah <laughs> i was just about to let you start talking so i kind of struggled with this one a little bit um, just based on what i'm saying you can probably guess that i didn't really you know, for me, I kind of look at You Only Live Twice because that's my lowest Sean Connery film, ignoring a certain film. So I kind of think, do I like this more or less than that film? And then I can go through them. And I got close, but I think I still liked You Only Live Twice more. Oh. Uh, and then it came down to, do I like Live, or, Live and Let Die or This more? And seeing how they're quite similar type of films, but I feel like this film had higher highs and didn't have that terrible boat chase, I'm going to say The Man with the Golden Gun is better than Live and Let Die. Mm. Um, so I'm going to put it as my number seven film. So underneath You Only Live Twice at six, but above Live and Let Die at number eight. Okay. That's that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of where I thought you would go, to be honest. Um, although I'm quite surprised that, yeah, I mean, I'm surprised that you, you liked it as much as you did. I, there's still enough that I liked honestly yeah. Uh, yeah. there's still enough that i liked in there um i was thinking that maybe it would go underneath live and let die but there, there was just enough stuff in there and i think when i think of which one would i prefer to re-watch i would probably prefer to re-watch this and enjoy the christopher lee stuff and the setting as well i was just m way more into the setting than live and let die like there is enough stuff in there and some of the comedy did work for me as well so like again very similar film but i think i would rather re-watch this then live and let die because it had the higher highs. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, um, uh, it's tricky because I, I really wanted to like this film more than I ended up um, because it's unlike live and let die, which I actually put at the bottom <laughs> last time I put it at the bottom of my rank. I, I really did not gel with that film very much. Uh, this one I was, as I was watching it, I, I felt like I was getting the comedy a lot better uh, I really liked Roger Moore more as Bond in this. I feel like it was such a step up. I don't know. I can't really pinpoint what exactly, but it just felt better him on screen um, and, you know, delivering the lines and, and the gags and everything. So that was great. Christopher Lee, obviously we spoke about, it's just a great actor. It's just a great presence on screen. The locations, I liked going back to Asia. I liked Bangkok and, and Macau and, and Hong Kong. They're all great locations. Um, and as we touched on, the whole core element of of this this assassin that sees himself as Bond, like similar to Bond, and and the parallels and the differences between them. Like if that was more in the film, I would have loved that. But it was nice to see it anyway at all. But there are f just a few things that really pulled it down for me. So yeah, J W Pepper. I forgot how annoying I found him in this film. 
Um, good night. <laughs> I made it quite crystal clear. I did not like that character. And you're right, like the other Bond girl, Anders, uh, she w really wasn't very memorable or, or interesting either. Um, the music, apart from the main theme, wasn't really there for me. Um, and I think you've kind of like the main problem that you've touched on is just the it's just the pacing. It's just so it's so bloated, as you say. You could have so much cut out of this, and a tighter, snappier film would have easily moved it up higher. So that said, I'm putting it <laughs> with all that negative and negative stuff still. It is a Roger Moore film, and I do have a soft spot for it, and I still had a good time watching it. So I'm putting it at number four. I'm putting it slightly above Diamonds Are Forever. Okay. But, but still below the likes of Dr. No, Thunderball, and From Russia of Love. So that is still quite high for you then. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing where we're getting further into this podcast and we're getting a bigger and bigger ranking. It's getting more difficult because you're starting to see films that you're like, well, actually, I like that one more than this one, but that one's above that. You know what I mean? So you start mm. to like get a bit tangled in your own ranking. Well, so... that's what I'm seeing with your rankings. Yours is very tangled between the Sean Connery and Roger Moore films because you got Live and Let Die at the bottom, but then now you've got this at number four where yeah. mine are quite nicely separated. <laughs> yeah. I'm, and maybe uh, that's more boring, but I know what kind of Bond I like. So they're, they're being separated in this nice way. I'm not making it easy for myself. Let's put it that way. No. But I want to just say what you're saying, like agree with you where an edited version of this film is probably better than Dr. No for me. And it's like, would would go above that in my list so dr no for me is at number four and i would probably put it above that and maybe on a majesty secret service an edited version of this film but unfortunately yeah. that's not what we got um like an hour and 40 version of this film is a really good bond adventure in my opinion it's just not what we got that's exactly it. if i was to look at these two films dr no and um man with the golden gun i would now i'd pick dr no because of it's just shorter and 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 tighter so I'm just surprised that Thunderball was up there when it was on my my bottom bottom five list, and it's 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 staying there, which just, is quite yeah, something. just nothing's overtaken. Like I know, film for me will definitely overtake it. I don't like down the line, but yeah, it's holding on in there. Nothing's been able to say like yeah, I liked it more. I think that's going to change next time, though. I really do. I, hope I really so. hope so. Yeah, I really yeah, I hope so as well. Make my list a bit more legit, wouldn't it? Hmm. Uh, okay, well, we won't uh, ramble anymore. That's the man with the golden gun. So we're at the end of the Guy Hamilton. Well, we're done, yeah? We're done with Guy Hamilton. Yeah. And we enter a different sort of Bond film uh, with The Spy Who Loved Me next week. So any any last words before we wrap this up? I'm going to go speak to Lulu for a bit. She's still here. Ah, oh, Lulu, is she? She's not yes. asleep in the wardrobe. <laughs> She she has fallen asleep because we've, we've spoke for so long about this film. So I'm going to go wake her up. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening. You have been listening to episode nine of the Bond Revisited podcast. Join us next week when the Bond Revisited podcast will return for The Spy Who Loved Me. 